Word Balloon. Celebrating 16 years of excellence for you. Ironside will not be seen tonight, so we may bring you the following special program. Welcome back, everybody. It's time again for another Word Balloon podcast live here on YouTube, uh, the Comic Book Conversation Show. John Suntra is here. Man, Jerry Ordway, great to see you. I'm looking forward to seeing you in person finally, uh, <laughs> you know, a couple of weeks from now at uh, at Terrificon. Yeah, yeah. It's been a but It feels like it's a year, but it's actually two years. Two years, man. Yeah. yeah. Did, uh, dude, do you remember? I keep telling this story uh, of you – Brett Breeding and another creator, I say on a, a Saturday night, and you introduced me to Brett. Brett's got his, uh, you know, Doomsday shirt on. And I'm like, oh, nice to meet you. And you're like, and here's Barry Kitson. And I lost my shit because I'm such a Barry <laughs> fan. And Brett's like, what am I, chopped liver? I killed Superman for guys. <laughs> and I felt so bad, but I'm like, Brett, I'm sorry. You don't understand. I'm like, I like, I love everything Barry does. You know? So, yeah, that was great, man. Honestly, it was so funny. Brett's pretty uh, pretty good at thinking on his feet. <laughs> <laughs> but man, dude, I'm you know again last week and we're still all bummed at at the loss of uh, Richard Donner, and and his great impact on Superman with that great movie from '78. And uh, Jesus, only a few months after the uh, the release of the movie, you, you painted this beautiful image. Yeah, yeah, I did that, and um, I was really I mean I, I really loved the the movie. And I think I saw it probably about four or five times while it was still in first run. Um, Cause you could do that back then. I mean, I didn't see it like every day, but Mike Macklin and I would probably go every couple of weeks. Hey, you want What do you want to do? Hey, let's go see Superman. Cause it was still playing at the, you know, this theater that had the cinema scope or Cinerama screen where it was like really wide screen. And then it curved forward a little bit in a, in a big theater. So, you know, it was the perfect, uh, venue to, to see something with special effects no question i um december of 78 is when it was released right in time for christmas right. and i remember riding my bicycle because even though there was snow on the ground it was plowed enough that i could ride my bike <laughs> to the theater and That's i had i had to had to see it man you know and and no and also one of the last movies that would have uh the overture before the right. film would start, and you'd come in and just hear the score for a few minutes, right. and that that incredible John Williams music. Oh my God, jeez, you know, yeah, Wayne's right. The good old days of movie watching. Wayne will be a terrific on as well. I know that for a fact. So, yeah, man, I think I think Superman, uh, the Star Trek motion picture, and like the Black Hole are like the handful of final movies. That had overtures before before anything started as far as the picture. And then that, did, go ahead. Did, did Close Encounter have one? 
close encounters? Because I feel like probably. I just we when we would go, you'd see like what maybe a total of two trailers before a movie. It wasn't like like I saw uh, Black Widow on yeah. Thursday, and Mitch and I were sitting there. Mitch Halleck and I were sitting there, and the, the movie didn't start for like twenty minutes. It was trailer after trailer. It was kind of fun, but at a certain point, you're like, okay, let's get on with the movie. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, man. So I should ask, I mean, what what trailers did they show? Well, we saw uh, Suicide Squad, a new one, uh, a different one than what they'd released like a couple of months ago or whatever. Yeah. Um, we saw Venom 2. We saw The Eternals. Um, again, though, that's the problem. Man. You, you, oh, Shang-Chi was, uh, was in there. Cool. Shang-Chi. You know, yeah, and, yeah. When, when you when you watch them, though, you, you kind of forget if it's like sure. so many of them, you come back and you go, what did I see? I remember <laughs> one of them. <laughs> Absolutely, man. That's I, no, I, that's I, great. I, totally, I blanked out on the seeing Venom, the trailer for Venom until like a couple of days ago. I went, wait, I saw. Oh, that was the other one. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I mean, you do. It's 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 overwhelming in a way. You know, it's like you're getting so much information at the beginning of the of the movie. When I saw Superman, like you said, I mean, it was kind of cool because again, it's the days when you, you sat in a theater that was probably, I would say like a, you know, much wider than what you're, you're seeing at a multiplex now, a big theater, maybe even with a balcony. And, yeah. uh, and that screen was really wide, you know, so you, you didn't have to sit in the first 10 rows because if you did, you'd get a crick in your neck or something. You, know, you could actually, you had to sit like way back, right? Um, but yeah, the 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 music, you know, all that was kind of like a way to kind of get you in the mood for it, rather than seeing like a bunch of trailers for stuff that you know may have some, you know, similarity. It might be science fiction, but back then, you know, it was part of that presentation that you you know you were just kind of like they prepped you for it. But again, by playing the John Williams and with Superman, especially. When the movie opens, you get the, you know, that screen. Basically, you get the, you know, the screen opens and then the Daily Planet. And then the, the music swells. The, the screen opens. The camera pans up to the sky. And then you get that awesome bum, 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 bum. Yep. Even to this day, I get chills. You know, it almost brings a tear to my eye when that bum, 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 bum. And then you see, you know, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. That just, it kills yeah. me, you know. That I'm was so such a hard-fought battle, you know? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Absolutely, man. No, oh, another comment from Wayne. He really misses those great musical scores. I agree. And also, uh, remember they had the souvenir book that you could oh, yeah. buy as well? Yeah, yeah. Mine's packed away, or I would have pulled it out to show everybody. It just occurred to me as we're talking mine's about kind it. Of, mine's in a bag in front of me, but I can't get to it. But No uh, problem. You had, it, you had the tabloid with the pictures. Is that what you're talking about? It was, yeah, it was like, yeah, it was a little, it wasn't as big as, say, a treasure. I remember the Treasury Edition yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, book as well. But yeah, it was like, you know, I, and and it's funny, uh, there was a guy at San Diego for years, I'm sure you stumbled across this table as well, that would sell those old movie programs. Yeah. And I rebought that one from him. I also bought Ice Station Zebra. Oh, oh yeah, that's a good and, movie. Oh, I love that movie. And you know, it's funny, Turner actually showed it last weekend. And then also... Um, I got, I got just because of the weirdness of where everybody is today. I couldn't help it. Can't <laughs> stop the music with the Village People and <laughs> Valerie Bryan and Bruce Jenner when, yeah, yeah. when you know, Caitlin was still Bruce Jenner back in the right. day. So yeah, I'm like, oh, that's an interesting like little. I'm like, I, I think I need to, I think I need to own that. So yeah, it was, it was great. But yeah, you know, uh, Donner, it's so funny. And I was telling you off the air, we just started doing uh, Gabe Hardman and I just started doing this great uh, new podcast. We're having a blast. We've only done one episode, but it's called Kinescope. And we're looking at the early, you know, live TV era. And Donner came in literally like right after that era ended. Right. I mean, he was he was right there at the early 60s, yeah. but it was just after all the big anthology shows and live TV. Well, he actually, I was reading in his obituary that he had he had started as an actor. And, oh, I didn't realize um, that. I'm trying to remember if it was... Uh, Kazan or somebody he he was like part of that wow. part of the stu whatever acting thing he worked with this director and the director said you're too controlling you should be a director 
Oh my God. I thought about it, it was like, oh, I could control the whole thing. So he, he kind of like that offhand Epiphany. comment, which is technically a criticism for an actor. <laughs> he he made something good with it, you know. I had no idea he was part of the actor's studio. That's amazing. It was like a it was one of those again, it's I think they said it was around 57, 1956, 57. Um, but it's kind of fascinating again how like an offhand comment can kind of maybe steer you in a direction, you know, make you start thinking like, wait, maybe I'm a control freak. I should be, you know, I should be doing this or that. Yeah. But, uh, no, absolutely. You know, I, I believe Bogdanovich got a similar uh, thing from like Uta Hagen or one of those method yeah. actors and stuff. And yeah, it's like, you know, you'd make a lot, a lot better director than you are an actor or whatever. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, I always love just Donner in interviews. And in fact, I was even listening to the one he did with, Gilbert Gottfried on his podcast and he just always seems so relaxed and, yeah. and just like, you know, could, uh, certainly confident, but not a jerk at all, but just like, and also just when, you know, getting from, I, he retold the story about getting the initial script from the Salkins, that Mario Puzo script. And he's like, you know, just all the mistakes they were making right. and, and knowing that he needed to get Tom Mankiewicz in there and and again, I mean, the proof is in the film. But like all the great stuff about Smallville, the farm, you know, everything that's all Donner, and that's so did, great that he knew that. Did you in again with all the stories after he passed? There was a really good one, which I I don't remember if I was on one of the DVDs or extras or whatever, but it was funny to read it. <clears throat> was that when he got that script, he said it was like 500 pages by Mario Puzo. <laughs> and he didn't feel like they were treating Superman well. So he called up he called up Tom Mankiewicz and he said, you know, come on over. I, you want you, you know, you gotta help me with this. We can make this good or whatever. And he said that what they sent the script and he, they said send him a Superman costume in his telling with the script. So when Mankiewicz drove up to his house, Donner flung the door open and ran out and he had the costume on with the tape. <laughs> and he, and the Mankiewicz was saying like you know, if I if I could have, I would have just driven away. Like, what is this guy crazy? And then they, you know, they wound up kind of bonding over the uh, the the things that they thought they could do with it. Which, uh, again, it's kind of from you know, people complain about like now the the internet's a big thing for you know everybody to voice their complaint about stuff. Back then, I remember reading every little tidbit that came out about the movie, and I remember being crushed when I read that they let him go, they basically fired him. He was ready to go back and, and work on the second, you know, finish working on the second and they fired him. And I remember that always being a sticking point for me. And it's always kept me from enjoying or liking Superman two. Sure. You know, even anything after that, but, but specifically Superman two, which a lot of people, you know, a lot of comic book people that I talk to, it's their favorite. And uh, I always had a problem with it because I felt like this was something where these guys had basically, you know, yanked it away from someone who knew what he was doing. And then they went for camp, you know, and that uh, that, that always bugged me. So it was funny when when Donner finally the I think the editor, Stuart Baird or somebody had re reassembled Superman two from his notes, the original script and notes, I guess. And um, but of course, by that point, you know, it's. 30 years later or whatever, you know, and, and uh, it was kind of unfortunate. And I always think about that with like the Snyder cut, which I really liked. And I was glad that they let him do for whatever, if you don't like it or, you know, you, it, it, everybody's got their own opinion. But for me, it felt like if only that existed when Donner, you know, like within a couple of years of that movie, when they could have maybe even gotten people back and, you know, given it another go. But in that case, Superman 2 was technically successful. So, you know, I think uh, it became kind of more of a fan thing over 20 some years. Gee, I wonder what this would have been like, you know. Um, at, at least we got it, though. I mean, we got it yeah. on DVD. Yeah. And, though, you know, you're right about that. And, 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 you know, I've always been a Richard Lester fan, yeah. not only because of the Beatles and Hard Day's Night and Help, but also uh, the Musketeer movies that he yeah. did. Yeah, and and it was funny. Donner had that same deal where yeah. really, and I remember reading as, you know, as the movie, the first movie came out, oh, we're shooting both movies at the same right. time, all right. that interesting stuff. And I'm really glad that the Donner cut exists because we get yeah. more Brando as Jor-El. Yeah. Um, but again, it's, and it is interesting to compare the two 
And I, and I bet enough of us, you know, nerds are like, oh, I absolutely want to see what Donner had done. God, that great, those couple great scenes, like when Lois jumps out of the planet, right, and and lands on the awning and stuff, yeah. or the great scene where she's got the gun and she shoots at him and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Oh my God, yeah, yeah that stuff is great. amazing. And also, and I always give it up to uh, Christopher Reeve, the physicality of being hunched over as Clark and right. then. And literally, like you see him grow. Yeah, he grows and, like three inches. Yeah. Yeah. And takes a glass. <laughs> Lois, I have something to say to you. And it's like, Jesus. I mean, and that and it, that's where you believe. I've got that other wonderful painting. And let's talk about that for a second uh, that you did. Look at the faces. I mean, that's that is great acting. And man, you capture it right there with those uh, Superman and Clark faces and stuff. And, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, because everyone's like, come on, glasses. Really? That's it. It's like, that's the brilliance of Christopher Reeve. He really did change his face and change yeah, his yeah. posture to make you think they are two different people. Well, they also had, I mean, if you think about it, that period in the 70s when they filmed it, they filmed it in like 76, came out in 70, or 77, it came out in 78. Yeah. Back then, if you wore glasses, which I did, and if you ever, if they look like, they look like gigantic masks, you know? So, I mean, the, you know, those, those glasses covered a lot of real estate, basically. Yeah. Yeah, we were all Harry Carey back then. You know, with the lens, the the no frame glasses might not have, uh, you know, fooled people. But uh, <laughs> I, I still remember because you know it's funny when you if you wear glasses. I remember having like, oh, here's the pair of glasses I had in 1977, and you know you start clearing out when you move and you go, I got to get rid of stuff. And I remember finding these glasses, and they were kind of brown plastic frames. And I put them on, and it was like my field of view was so great. You know, I can look. It's like seeing an, an IMAX. <laughs> <laughs> but, I've got but pictures was, of my. I got pictures that of was myself. Like a way for the for that era specifically was that that was that time when when you know you had Robert Mitchum showing up uh, on the Tonight oh, God, Show yeah. and the Gigantic or Dean Martin. <laughs> yes. What well, or Harry Carey? Like I said, yeah. <laughs> yeah you know, true. yeah. And uh, and no, you're right. I have a I have a great college picture of myself from the early '80s, and I look like Elvis Costello. I'm thinner too, which is nice. <laughs> but yeah, no, absolutely, man. Oh, interesting comments from everybody here. Let's uh, let's uh, put these up. Michael Cooper's got a couple. He's like that final scene with Glenn Ford is Pac Kent gets yeah. to me every time. Oh, absolutely, you are here for a reason. Yeah. I don't know what that reason is, but it's not to score touchdowns. Absolutely, well, his, his his line reading is great too because he does this. Uh, when he's talking, he's walking and talking. He does that. I don't know. And then he just kind of looks at, and I always wondered whether he forgot the line and they just kept going because it's such a raw and real moment. You know, he, and he just shakes his head. I don't know or whatever is, is, is such a, a big moment. It makes me wonder though, if that's how the script went or if he basically got like ran out of his words and then just, they just kept rolling because they really did have this, I mean, that's that 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 one scene because he only has a couple scenes with Clark. That right. one scene is so strong that it kind of pervades the whole movie. I mean, that that you know, there's so much heart in that in that little interaction. Um, uh, it was just that's one of my favorite scenes. I agree, man. I mean, I I don't think Ford's screen time is more than ten or fifteen minutes at most. Yeah. And what he does to it, those scenes, and 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 again, not to not to pick on uh, Man of Steel. But I, I mean, and I love Kevin Costner, and I love the idea of Kevin Costner's yeah. Pop Kent. But man, Glenn Ford blew him away, and just <laughs> well, he just it was everything right. And even in yeah. uh, Smallville, yeah. I love when John Snyder, God, that with the the Christopher Reeve episode yeah. Yeah. where they finally discover, you know, the Kryptonian language, and you will, you know, you will rise above the men, Kal El, and you will right. rule them, and everything. And Clark's freaking out, like, what am I supposed to do? And he's like, Hey, I'm your father. Right. No, he goes. You, you, don't worry. You like we right. got this, and it's just so great. And it's like, yeah, man, that's that's Jonathan Kent. And yeah. that, and then, and again, not to pick on Man of Steel, but it's like, no, Kent's help people. Right. And and they and yeah, sure, they're afraid they don't want Clark to be revealed, but but their first thought is always, how can we help the community? That's why I, I'm, I'm loving Superman and Lois so much, and they really do focus more on Martha. Yeah. That's fine. That's totally fine. Yeah. But just that idea that, yeah, Martha was like kind of, you know, if anyone was in trouble in Smallville, they went to Martha Kent and she helped right. them. 
And I'm, are you enjoying the show? I love the show. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I went into it thinking I wasn't – I didn't like the, the casting, really. I mean, they didn't win me over on the crisis episodes. I just kind of was like, you know, but in the in its own show, to me, it's like a good – it's a testament to the power of performance and writing is that in the first episode, I was like, okay, I see it now, you know? Um, I just wasn't, I guess, you know, I was looking at it in a, like someone looking at Dean Cain at the time when Lois and Clark, you go, is Dean Cain, does he look like Superman? Is he enough of a Superman? Because everybody's got that kind of, you know, that image of him and Christopher Reeve embodied that look. I think Henry Cavill does it too. I think yes. Cavill's really good. Um, but there's something that almost opens you up to being nervous about somebody if they don't look dead on in that first shot you think well they gotta win me over you know but uh but i was gonna say as far as i was thinking about kevin costner because i watched the let let him go on uh, hbo max last night with kevin costner and diane lane right the kents they're back a really good really good movie but i was thinking about him as pa kent and i think when people you know it was like a polarizing scene in the movie because basically he sacrificed himself Whereas in Superman, the movie, he has no choice in it. You know, he has a heart attack, he dies. And um, I was thinking about this, like, well, Costner still brings that. Of all the guys that they could have gotten, Costner can bring that kind of heart, you know, to the scene. And I think he did. Yes. Yes. But we all wind up judging him going, why did he let himself die? (laughs) You know? Well, yeah. (laughs) Well, again, because, I mean, again, back to the Donner film, that great scene with Jeff East when he's young Clark and he's talking to his mother and he's like, right. all my powers and I couldn't save him. Yeah. And, and it's like, yeah, but Henry, Ca- you know, uh, Cavill could have ran. <laughs> right. Right. If only he'd got him training like two weeks before that at uh, tornado. <laughs> well, and you know, you know, he, the powers probably manifested themselves already and it's just, right. Right. no, no, don't. And I'm like, no, what are you doing? And also it's funny. Wait, you, go ahead. Go ahead, Jerry. That, makes him, that actually makes him kind of tragic because he, Pa Kent, his thinking was so inflexible, it was so pragmatic that he felt like the minute he revealed himself, he would become, he would be under, under the microscope. So for him, it was like he was willing to take that to his grave. Sure. So in a way, he becomes kind of like a polarizing, tragic figure in a way. You know, I mean, it, it's... Oh, yeah. And that kind of fits. Maybe it didn't fit for 2012 or whenever the movie came out, but it certainly would fit for 2016 through now. You know what I mean? I Someone who's, who's convinced of themselves and convinced of their position to the point of dying, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I agree with you, man. No, and, and you're, you know, I, I am less harsh on Man of Steel than I initially <laughs> was. And, and mentioning Superman and Lois... Uh, you know, uh, I was just talking to Mark Wade a couple weeks ago, and again, another another guy who really knows the Superman, and he's like, Yeah, he felt the same way. Tyler Hecklin, he's like, he's too small. Yeah. And I agreed with that, but one thing I do think he did from the moment he showed up on Supergirl, man, he's a great Clark Kent. He yeah. really he's a terrific yeah. Clark Kent. But and see, uh, always what I think they they and again they're smart because when they build a show like that, they're not building Superman the movie. They're building a character who's already married and he has kids. So in a way, they're casting him almost as Pa Kent. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So so his Superman is gonna be different than the guy when he was first, you know, when he first becomes a hero and when his parents are alive. Just like I mean, like, you know, I was a totally different person before I got married and had kids than I am now, you know, because when I was even up to when I was in my thirties, my mom was still alive, you know, and you have kind of a different base and then suddenly you become that authority figure to somebody else. So that's what I think he projects really well. He projects this perfect kind of struggling dad, you know, trying to reach his kids and trying to do the right thing. And maybe sometimes, you know, things don't work out the right way or the kid thinks you're an idiot because you won't let him do something or whatever. And, Hey, I've gone through that, you know. Sure, <laughs> sure. Well, and I even, you know, to, to the level of Jordan's powers manifesting, 
and Clark being like, hey, I know what you're going through. No, you don't. And it's like, no, actually, I do. Right. I, like, I went through all of this. And right. God, every, uh, every when his generation vision, has to go through it themselves. That's the, when, yeah, it, yeah. when his heat vision was out of control on the football field, and Clark's like, just beam it into my hand. And and also, I like that he's less invulnerable. Yeah. Uh, and, and that, you know, yeah, it did hurt when, when right. the kid was doing that. <laughs> but I also loved it in Smallville when his heat vision manifested in, I can't think of her name now, Krista Allen. That that right. was her name, the hot teacher. And right. he's like, uh, think about what you were thinking. Of. They, they prop up the scarecrow. <laughs> think about it. And he burns up the scarecrow. And John Stout is just laughing his ass off. He's like, uh-huh. <laughs> I mean, that's it, really, and, and it's, thank God, on the, on the writing staff, you got Guggenheim and you got Jeff Johns, who really know the character. Right. And it's going back to what you were saying about um, – the original uh, Superman script. Um, I I remember talking to Jeff when he and Donner were plotting that arc in Action Comics, and he's like, "I've seen the original Mario Puzo script. It was like 500 pages and so ridiculous." Yeah. He's like, "Everything that Richard said about it is so true." Yeah. And you know, yeah, you know, do you ever do you ever get a chance when being at DC to go through any like cool archive stuff like that, early Action, early Superman, anything? I I went through the they used for anybody who doesn't know they used to have a library of bound comics and uh, <clears throat> the library was very exclusive. You had to make an appointment, and there was a librarian, Alan Asherman, I think, was for the longest time was the librarian, and basically he would let you take some books down. You would sit at a table and read them. It's not like you took them home. Sure. <laughs> I tried to do that when I was do, when I was preparing for the Shazam monthly. Because there really wasn't a lot of, uh, I mean, it was a, a lost period of, of Wiz comics that hadn't been reprinted, like in the 70s. And uh, I was looking for Wiz comics and mas Master Comics. And unfortunately, DC had very little of that. And that's probably the most time I spent in the library was, you know, looking at volumes where it would be like issue three and then issue 45, you know, they basically got these things at a late stage when they bought the property from Fawcett. Fawcett turned over what they had. Maybe DC sure. tried to find some copies. But, uh, you know, with Superman and all the other stuff they have from issue one, they Isn't have that all, these, all these bound volumes. So, uh, um, but, you know, I mean, I think back then when I was doing the Shazam thing, I, I actually went out and bought a microfilm reader because you could buy – People had had made microfilm or microfiche, uh, yeah, whole issues. <clears throat> so I had like Wiz Comics, wow, the beginning through issue forty five or something, and I had a, I had a bunch of this stuff that I would sit down and read with a notebook, and make notes or sketches while I was looking at the screen, you know, of characters that I might want to use or, or you know, scenarios that were interesting and stuff. But uh, um, now it's you know, it, it's like this with anything. It's like it's such an amazing amount of stuff on the Internet. If you need a costume or you need a specific reference, you type in Wikipedia. You got, you know, tons of visuals you could look at. But back then, you either had a comic collection that had everything, which, you know, very few people had that. Sure. <laughs> or you would have to try to find back issues or where did it get reprinted or whatever. So, yeah, it was... A little harder, but I was going to say when you were talking, we were talking about the Richard Donner with the script, and then working with Jeff Johns on the uh, action comics. The funny thing is, for a long time, people don't realize they think why did Warner Brothers and DC let all this happen? Was that the Salkines? Number one, the Salkines were all about big deals, right? I mean, they probably had some. Someone in that group had love of movie, but basically it was like this yeah. big prestigious business that they could be in. And Richard Donner got hired because of that. So they hired Mario Puzo because he was the biggest author at the time. But Donner got hired because he did The Omen, which was the biggest movie. And when the, you know, when the Salkines lost their, their director, they threw a million bucks at Donner, but they luckily found a guy who had some sensibility for it. So, I mean, that's, that's like a weird accident in a way but he's the guy who cast christopher reeve and that's very important because christopher reeve was you know our generation's superman right um, but you know you think about those things and how weird they you know that that sometimes stuff lines up like that the Salkines also controlled superman 
and DC couldn't do anything with it. Basically, the Salkinds paid whatever their licensing fee, and as long as they used the property, they would renew it. So for years and years and years, Warner Brothers would, and DC would have wanted to get rid of that deal, but they couldn't. Right. So, you know, when, when the Salkinds couldn't produce more movies, then they did Superboy, the TV show. And uh, at a certain point, I think Warner Brothers might have played hardball and just said, yeah, we're not going to do another movie. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think that was their yeah. only recourse at that point to get it out of their hands. Otherwise, you know, uh, it's kind of like with Sony and Spider-Man, except that this was an individual and his kid and, you know, partners or whatever, as opposed to a whole studio. Um, no, you're right. And he was, uh, uh, so the elder cell kind was a legend as far as uh, producers in old Hollywood and old international yeah. films. And uh, you're right. And and also, um, God, it's well, it's like Michael Uslan having the option on the Batman movies as early right. as he did. And he still has a hand in uh, in the new in the newer products and stuff. So so absolutely. Um, and it's funny, you actually do kind of answer uh, what Michael is saying here that he enjoyed that first opening credit sequence in Superman three. Yeah, that was fun directed by Lester. That was a lot of good kind of um, slapstick uh, visual yeah. comedy and stuff. But I what happened? Really never, I was never lousy, liked yeah. that. I just never liked. That. I hear you, man. Superman three does have like that sequence with him fighting himself. In yes, the, that's in the best the, thing about it. That movie's the, the Lana Lang stuff is really good. You know the Smallville stuff with Mark sure. and the going. Yep. From, you know what I mean? All that stuff was really. Yep. No, agreed. It works on a heart level, you know. And yeah. Him fighting himself works. It's just the other stuff that's like. I mean, Richard. I mean, it's funny too because Richard Pryor is a great was a he was a good actor, but he's just there for comedy relief. He yeah, could have not, actually played a decent character, you know. But he could have. Again, it's about sensibilities, and I don't think they had any clue what that character was or how he should be. You know. Totally agree, man. Absolutely agree. And yeah, it's a shame because he would have been. It would have been better served, you know. And poor Robert, he, even Robert Vaughn. Robert yeah. Vaughn's a great bad guy. Yeah, or, yeah, well, yeah. You know, I had the pleasure. I got to meet him a couple of times. He was he was a really interesting guy beyond I mean, I'm like, holy shit, it's Napoleon Solo. <laughs> <laughs> so all these, I mean, if you think about it, like someone like Robert Vaughn, he had a persona based on years and years, just like William Shatner, an actor, there's a persona yes, and there's a absolutely. reception of the character, of the actor as a character. That if you were saying we want this guy as the bad guy. It's kind of down to the script to make that work. You know what I mean? Because I do you know what you're going to get. Like Robert Vaughn's going to play Robert Vaughn's basic shtick. Right. You it's know? bad guy stuff. So if Absolutely. you don't write it, if you don't write it to him or you don't write it to that sensibility, it's not going to work. Right. Um, that's the big thing. I, I, I just feel like uh, every one of those Superman movies has good moments in them. And, Christopher Reeve was solid. Uh, all the, the main characters were all solid in all of the movies. They were better than the movies. You know, they like the grid. Christopher Reeve was always believable. He always brought it right. Um, Margot Kidder did as well. I mean, all those characters, those actors were really well cast. And it ultimately is Everybody. sad because they made four movies. And, you know, you look at bits and pieces of each one and go, well, here it's good. Here it's bad. And it's a shame. It, it it really, you know, again, with a if if Donner had done worked on the second one, there probably still would have been dopey stuff in it. But I think it would have had an internal logic to it, you know, because um, I mean, you know, the, the when they, we were kids, well, when I was not even a kid, but when I was a younger man, when ABC ran the first Superman movie, they expanded it to a like a four hour or three hour slot or something. It was in two nights. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they pulled, they were pulling footage, everything that, you know, hadn't been used, they were pulling. And there was a lot of campy stuff that you, when you look at it now, you go, okay, Donner probably filmed a lot of this stuff at the in insistence of the producers. This is because that's kind of where it went after he left, you know, but there's a scene with the feeding the alligators. And I think they were even like, Luther was like dropping Otis in to the alligator pit or something. And he's, you know, trying to talk his way out of it. I mean, those are funny scenes, but they don't, they wouldn't have helped that movie, you know, initially. 
they're fun to watch, but they don't really help the narrative. They're just more like, okay, it's fun that we set to see these. Or you and, had a little, you had a little bit more of Kirk Allen and Noel Neal right, as right. as Lois's parents, and obviously yeah. the nod to the forties Superman serials that Kirk Allen and yeah, Noel and did. And it was fun. And it, even you yeah. think about it, when Clark jumps across in front of the train, that's almost an early Superman cover. You know, the it's like an, a long leaping stride kind of on one of the early Superman covers with a train. So, I mean, they were definitely, uh, they knew what they were, what they were going for, you know? You know, uh, there's that great, I think it was second season episode of Smallville where, uh, hot, uh, terrorists take over, uh, the Lex, the Luther building and, 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 uh, Martha's held hostage and Clark has to leap from the planet to the Luther building. Right. And we mentioned the John Williams score. And I, I remember talking to Jeff Loeb about this when he was a producer on Smallville or after the fact, but when we were talking about this episode, Clark, when he psychs himself up to jump in the original CW or WB, maybe back then broadcast, I am convinced they used the John Williams music yeah. because it was that dun, 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 dun. And it's like, Holy shit, he's gonna do it. He's <laughs> gonna be Superman. This is gonna be amazing. And then for the syndication and the DVDs, they switched out the music and they made it something else. And it works. But I mean, oh, it's like, oh, if only because Dude. it was such a perfect moment. Oh my god. That drives I'm me telling nuts. you, man. When I'm watching shows that are, you know, where they replace the music, some cases what they'll do is to just get like a where did I see? I was watching something recently, and what they did was it seemed like they got probably a local or small band to re-record the classic songs because then they didn't have to pay Aerosmith or whoever right. was the performance, right. whatever that performance royalty or whatever. <laughs> it was just funny, though, because it was like, wow, this is almost like the band you'd see at your friend's wedding. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, hey, it's great because those musicians got work, so that's, you know, that's always good. Um but it's just funny, like when you watch these things, you go, "Really? There's no way that was that sounded like that when I was watching it 20 years ago." But, Absolutely. Uh, oh, I like this. Uh, Michael Reed says it's. Uh, I've heard people interpret uh, the movie as being sort of a comedy in which only Clark is in on the joke, and in which he acts like the klutz with godlike power. Absolutely, man. God, when he when he catches the bullet, when he and Lois are being mugged in the alley and stuff, right. and I loved the callback to that. In the Wonder Woman movie, I'm glad Patty Jenkins yeah, yeah. did that. I thought that was terrific. Well, you can so, tell that there was a lot of there was a lot of Superman, a lot of Richard Donner in both of the Wonder Woman movies. You know, the the second one has the, uh, you know, the almost their version of turning back time. You know, it's the well, this doesn't make sense, but we'll go with it. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, that's kind of cool. I mean, I, I felt like with the with the movie, it's the, almost the first time you really see Clark in action with Lois and he sells he oversells the nerdy stuff which is really the only time he's that nerdy is that really that sequence but it's a great intro and it's an actual very tense scene you know so he basically takes the bullet in multiple ways he's taken the bullet for her but he's also taken the bullet in that he's not coming off as a hero for saving her but instead he's the wimp who, who fainted you Faints. know yeah, but but the audience knows, and then he tosses the bullet aside, you know. Yep. Um, and then, I, and that, I, scene's, that scene's immediately followed by him telling her that it wasn't worth, you know, fighting over her lipstick and her, you know, makeup oh. and comb and whatever. She's <laughs> like, "How did you describe everything in my purse?" And it's like, "Lucky guess." And then he walks away, and yep. she's like, <laughs> "That's." And that's I also love when he. The, that's what made the Donner one special. The, the, yeah, the it's charming. One doesn't have that. No, I agree with that. Absolutely. And again, it's there's got to be a, a better, like a, a closer nod to the Donner Meek Clark. That do, I mean, I get it, and I don't, I don't mind uh, a, a more, you know, uh, confident Clark Kent. I always love that about the George Reeves, you know, TV show. Right. That and I and uh, people probably have, are sick of me saying this. I'm, I'm sure I'm a broken <laughs> record, but I always love when they're in trouble. When Jimmy and Lois are in trouble, it's like, God, I wish Mister Kent were here. He'd know what to do. Right. right. And that's what I. And also, just when he'd get in, like you know, Inspector Henderson's face, and like, all right, Bill, you're not giving me the real story here. What's going on? <laughs> all right, Kent. You know, and it's truly <laughs> investigative reporters. So that's like, yeah, man, Clark Kent is very capable. And yeah. so there's 
So there is that part to him and everything, and I do well, like so, that. In the in the TV show, Superman's more of a mysterious figure in a way. You know, I mean, he shows up, saves them, but then he immediately exits, and Clark Kent comes back. There's no, there really aren't that many moments in the TV show from the '50s where he stood around and and gained all the uh, applause and what have you. I mean, they, you know, he, he was basically there as the act of God to save everybody. I wa I yep. watched the the uh, '50s show because I had gotten them on uh, DVD a couple of years ago from my family had given them to me for birthdays and stuff. Oh, that's great. So I watched, I had watched the first season, but then I hadn't really re or watched the other ones. So in the last year during the, you know, everybody oh, sitting at home, I watched the, the other seasons, which I never had that great. I'd seen them in the past. I think I even watched them with Nickelodeon or Nickelodeon ran them back in the eighties, late eighties, yeah. early nineties. Sure. Um, but, it, but they're, they were fun to watch now because for me, it's, you know, 30 years after I s wrote Superman. So I don't, I'm not like, I, have to, I don't have the same stakes in it or the same, you know, like disappointment as I did back then. It was like, why didn't they do this? Why? Now I can look at them and go, oh, it's cute. But every one of those episodes, you can, I can watch and say, that would be a, I could make that into a believable comic. You know what I mean? The, the germ of it is there. Um, you could definitely, that's the writer in me when I watch this stuff, when I watch anything, I'm always thinking, wow, that would be, if you did this, this, and this. Um, but I keep doing that with, uh, you know, you never, once you, once your brain is like on that, it's hard not to think of Superman stories or, you know, stuff that you've worked on. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the TV show, there's one where he, uh, I still, it cracks me up to watch it. And it kind of blew my mind where he takes the, the guys who figure out who he is, like a cat burglar comes in and steals his costume out of his, you know, he's going to rob Clark Kent's apartment. The closet. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then you think at first you're thinking like, wow, he must have better security. No, he doesn't have any security. And then he, the guy, you know, steals the costume and then they try to blackmail, like we know you're Superman. And it's like, he kind of doesn't really fight it the way he should, you know? But the way the episode ends is the most mind blowing is that he takes these the bad guys to like a, a peak, a mountain peak, icy, snowy, you know, Rocky Mountains or something. And then he basically leaves them there and they die. <laughs> and yep. the episode ends with him laughing with Jimmy and Lois or giving a <laughs> wink or something. And you're like, oh, that was dark. <laughs> I completely agree. The first two, the black and white se uh, 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 seasons are really. I think very edgy for a kid show, and yeah. then also, um, and as a, as also a Captain Marvel uh, writer and artist, um, I always say those first two seasons of Adventures of Superman compared to the Saturday morning Shazam show, Superman looks like Pulp Fiction. Right. Because, I mean, the toughest things they let you know poor Captain Marvel <laughs> do. All right, he's going to uproot a tree. He might he might have a car while he's flying. Right. <laughs> they, there was no, you know, violence whatsoever in that show. The elders come out and and lecture him on, you know, why this tree killing this car was a good thing because it's force of nature. And yeah, there was too many lessons in that. I, I again, it's funny when you, it, it all depends on how old you are. I mean, I was when that came out when the Shazam show in seventy. Yeah. Was it like 77 or something or 78, 79? I think it was even earlier than that, man, because I think yeah, I was yeah, only like, right. nine, like 70, 74. I, yeah, yeah, I was going to say like 74. Yeah. So oh, I, mean, my, I don't know what my lights are doing there. I apologize. All of a sudden, point, I'm in that I remember thinking like, you know, I was a little too old for that at the time. I was already in, you know, of drinking age. So I didn't get up <laughs> for a cartoon <laughs> or a TV show on a Saturday morning. There was just no way. But, uh, I always felt bad when you'd see him, like you'd see the actor like strapped on the front of a, of a truck. He was strapped and they had the camera going. It was like, I always felt bad. Like that guy must've had back issues, <laughs> you know? Think yeah. That. You yeah. Got, you're, you're propped up basically from the waist down with your top half. And as that car is hitting bumps, it's like, Oh my God, look at the damage we're doing to his spine. <laughs> was that, was that Jackson or was that John Davy? The second they did it with both of them. They did it. With wow. Them. Yeah. Jesus. And I, I met, like they're always off-roading, you know. So that was the thing is like they'd be on those mountain roads in uh, in you know California desert or whatever, and they would be hitting bumps, and you know he would be <laughs> jangling around, and you thought, God, that 
not only probably getting dust in his face, but, uh, you know, just that, that disruption. He's probably going, man, they're not paying me enough for this. <laughs> I have no doubt. Absolutely, man. You know, Eric, uh, uh, Jason uh, says hello from Hawaii. And uh, Jason's another podcaster. He's a good buddy. And he wants to know, have you and your family ever been to Hawaii? I've never been to Hawaii. I think the oh, furthest uh, furthest I've been is uh, California. Well, Jason knows the Hawaii convention people. Maybe uh, <laughs> Jason can uh, put the bug in their ear to get you a trip out to Hawaii. Uh, the Vasic wants to know, he would love to hear the genesis of Wildstar for Image Comics. I thought it was such a strong book. I want to know what happened. I love that time in comics. Well, we, with Wildstar, I knew all the guys who had started up Image. I was friends with Rob Liefeld. I knew Todd McFarlane. I was friends with Eric Larson, Mark Silvestri. I didn't know Jim Lee. Um, okay. And I knew that, you know, what they were doing was, you know, for all the People, there's a lot of naysayers, but at the time, that was such a positive for creators because they they basically took, they're the they were the first guys to take their comic book audience and basically have that audience follow them to their own creations. I mean, Absolutely. anybody else, you know, in the '80s when when uh, uh, comic creators did stuff for Eclipse Comics or whatever that was a creator own thing, they generally would do something like here's what I always wanted to do that I can't do at Marvel or DC. Um, but with the image guys, those guys were on, t on top selling books. So they basically did, okay, here's our version of the X-Men or here's my version of, you know, Spider-Man or whatever. And sure. they brought that audience, which I just, I was so, you know, positive about that. It was like, there were so many naysayers uh, when those books came out. So I was like a big booster. And uh, I knew Al Gordon. Al Gordon and I were friends. And uh, at one point, I had, um, I think I I thought about trying to push one of my own creations. And uh, then I was thinking I was still working on Superman. We were building up to the death of Superman. Um, so I didn't really have the ability to be that focused on multiple things. So I said, well, if Al Gordon, I said to Al, I said, well, we'll, we'll co-plot it. You can script it and ink it. Ink it. And, you know, um, Image is happy to do it. So we were like the first book outside the, the core Image guys that actually got wow. the light, you know, um, because of the delays. We weren't the first one published, but we were actually still published when they were in the Malibu deal. So issues one and two were published through Malibu. Um, so that was like, the, you know, again, part of that early, early core, the core group of guys. It would have been like the first non-founding member book. Um, Is that him there? Yep, that's a. Uh, I think that's one of the uh, pinups that John Stadema did for the trade when we did the trade paperback. We got, um, I got Joe Sinnott inking Kurt Swan for my my side of wow. it. Wow, Stadema, and then I got Mike Zek doing one, and then Al Gordon got Bruce Tim, Mike Mignola, and. I don't remember who else. It feels like there would have. I, I know I had the three. I thought he might have had three too. But anyways, that was for the trade. But uh, we we sat down. We talked about what we wanted to do, and we were both like fans of time travel, and we both loved Terminator. We loved the idea of the soldier who comes back to try to correct some 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 aspect of time. So that's where it started. And then we spent really we spent like the a whole summer. I would say at least a couple of months sending, I would send sketches for characters back and forth as we kind of figured out we had like seven or eight core characters working on designs of what their powers are going to be, how they work in the book. What's the, you know, the idea. And, uh, um, but I always, env I always, I had so many projects lined up after this. I always envisioned it was going to be four and done. So that's okay. why I pushed when we did the story, the story ends where it began it's almost like a loop which i thought was fun because it's a time travel story it winds up being a loop where the sun continues the loop in other words it's like it starts out with old beat up wild star not the sun but the younger version of him winds up continuing this loop um so i never had any i wasn't like i oh you know al and i had a hard time working together because there was no editor to stand in and you know help with any kind of arguments we had to hash it out 
Um, and there wasn't an editor standing with a whip to, to make sure those, you know, everybody kept pace. But but I knew I was only going to do the four issues, and okay. uh, I had I still had Shazam, which was a ninety six page graphic novel that I would I was writing and painting it, so it was wow. full yeah. art, right? And I had at that point when I was leaving Superman, I was going to leave Superman originally, but so I had time to finally finish the graphic novel. And DC was very patient. I said, look, if if I do this first, there's I'm going to have a higher profile after this, then maybe the graphic novel will sell better or whatever. But, you know, they, they were very patient in, in letting, basically giving me a year off, you know. Um, I understand. Yeah. But at the time I'd only had, I think I had probably, I think I had 17 pages fully penciled, inked and colored. And I had the whole thing plotted out 96 pages, but I was only, you know, I'd only gotten up through maybe the, I don't even think I'd gotten, maybe I'd just gotten to the sequence in the Shazam book. The first part all takes place in Egypt, and there was a lot of reference and a lot of research I did. But I think I was up through that Egypt spot, and I was just starting on the uh, the pages with uh, Billy Batson in, um, you know, Fawcett City and in, in that part of the origin. So, you know, it was like a, you know, again, it was nice that they basically said, okay, and that was the days of, you know, Dick Giordano was the uh, um, the president. You know, Paul Levitz was a president. Jeanette Kahn was the supreme being. They were all super nice and they were all very creatively motivated. So from their point of view, you know, they could see the, the uh, they could definitely see the logic of it that when I was Superman, the death of Superman wasn't a big thing at that point. See, I mean, it was, we had just come up with the idea. We were just, it was just starting to build momentum, but it was still a couple months away from being published. So at that point, Wildstar would have made me higher profile creator. Obviously, you know, the way things worked out, the death of Superman made me a higher profile creator, so I wouldn't have needed it, but it was fun to do it. It was fun to be, uh, it was fun to, to control something, but it was also scary because you know, not many people are, are cut out to be their their own businessman, business person. You know, it's a lot of, it's hard to do, it's hard to continue to draw something or keep something on schedule if you also have to be part of legal meetings and, you know, uh, a lot of the other stuff, you know. I do know, and I, I do, this is, as I continue to say to my comic book friends, I have this kinship with you guys doing the podcast and doing something creative, but also having that handle the business side. So I know what you mean. Magic well, K has a great comment. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jerry. No, I was going to say, when you, we, the thing is, like you could see nowadays, Jeff Johns is, uh, is doing um, Geiger with uh, right. um, Gary Frank, and he set up a studio. He set up an entity because, of course, I mean, you know, uh, he's also got income from TV shows and movies and stuff. So that helps. But he set up a business entity. He hired an editor. He's got that kind of that part. Of, so he's not worrying about making all those decisions and stuff. He can, concern, you know, concern himself with the creative stuff. That's what was lacking in the image days was that everybody was doing it uh, from the seat of their pants. They were all doing it, you know with no experience editing and no experience dealing with the printer. And, you know, ultimately I think uh, some of them, some of the image founders were better than others at that, but it's a, it's a lot and, and people don't understand it. Nowadays you can equate it with, uh, you know, complaining about some, Oh, I paid for this Kickstarter a year ago and the book isn't out yet. Well, it's the same kind of thing because to run a, a fundraising campaign like Kickstarter, you, you it's so all encompassing that you don't have time to do the work. So that's right. You know what I mean? Uh, I unless you're uh, like when I did it with Alex DeCampi for semi auto magic, we wound up, I was able to draw, she handled most of the business stuff and I would basically post pages in progress on Twitter as a way to kind of keep, you know, people aware of it, but sure. You know, to, to massage a Kickstarter campaign or a, any crowdfunding campaign requires a lot of a lot of effort for if it's a month long thing, you basically have to clear your schedule because you've got to promote 
almost every day, every waking hour, you have to keep that thing going. You know? No question, man. Um, Absolutely. No. And, and again, uh, a recurring conversation with creators and how they handle it themselves or they get, thankfully, now there's more apparatus where you can hire, uh, uh, you know, people to handle your campaign for you and stuff. No, I agree with all that. Uh, one question Magic K has is what's your favorite uh, faucet Captain Marvel story from back in the day? I always liked the uh, Monster Society of Evil, the the collected thing. I, I still have the hardcover. I think I got it after maybe a couple of years after it came out. Um, I like the build. It's like a slow build on it. Twenty five uh, issues, right? It ran, like it was a shit ton of issues. Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of issues because they were all like the backup stories. You know, were kind of like the B stories in the book. Yeah, um, and I remember the the funny thing about it too. I know there's like a lot of at the time it was of interest to me because I remember the biggest, one of the biggest or two of the biggest Captain Marvel uh, fans were Don and Maggie Thompson. And when I was doing the graphic novel, when I was working on the pages, I remember at one point it was, it meant a lot to me to show the pages to them because especially Don, I guess I have the feeling Don was like the bigger Shazam Captain Marvel fan, but I'm not, I'm not hundred percent on it, but I, it was important to me to show them the pages and I did show them at, uh, I think it was the Philadelphia convention around that time with the death of Superman. It was a Philly con in maybe 93 or something. And that was the first time I met Alex Ross as well. Um, he was, Oh, wow. It was right. It was right before Marvel's it was coming out. It, whatever the timing was, it was, he was working that sounds on right. a period. And, yeah. Uh, but anyways, I got to show the, they took my original artboards to the show. And I showed it to Don and, you know, like off to the side. And uh, we talked about, you know, the Captain Marvel stuff and the Shazam stuff. And he knew all the lore. He was definitely uh, into it. But he had said that he had talked to the guys when they were doing the, or the Otto Binder, I guess, was writing the the Shazam, the Mr. Mind story, the monster, you know, the monster Five system story. of evil. Yeah. And he said when they were doing it, they didn't have Mr. Mind in mind. They didn't know. Wow. So it was like they knew they wanted to surprise people. But he said it, it, when you read it now, you look at it and you go, oh, they, they had the greatest thing that they kept the wraps on it until the end reveal when you see that the mastermind is the worm. But it was actually, you know, that they didn't know. They, were, they went into it kind of like still working it out, which is a lesson for anybody if you're a writer, a lot of times comics are made up on the fly. You know, sometimes they're they're uh, the best stories come out of like snatching them out of the air. Elements might be there. You might have a different game plan, but then when it comes time to start typing up a plot, there is autom almost a sense of automatic writing sometimes, where you start in one place thinking, "Here's where I'm going to end," and then halfway through you go, "Huh." I think we're going in a different direction and you just keep going and then you wind up with something different. And that's when you always feel like the, you know, the writing gods have blessed you no <laughs> because it does, it does happen. And part of it is momentum. And part of it is probably just having a, a head full of uh, stupid memories from your childhood. <laughs> Did you ever get a chance uh, to meet CC Beck? No, no. He, um, okay. I, I always felt like it's going to sound wrong. I felt kind of glad that he had, that I didn't get involved with the graphic novel or that project until after he was already gone. Yes. Because I think it would have been hard to do it and have any confidence in what I was doing if he had been, for example, sitting off to the side writing nasty letters to the buyer's guide or something. Sure. Because he was, he was very opinionated, which he was had a right to be. You know, no one would like say he didn't have a right to his opinion on that as a co-creator of the book but i think that would have been very distracting and a little bit demoralizing you know um there you go. yeah uh jeff dyer has a great question uh, you work with uh, john byrne and kurt swan on uh, the earth stealers uh arc and uh, that was Byrne's idea for a film do you know how close that came to becoming a superman movie all i know is what i remember being told at the time was that he had written it it was part of the way I heard it was when he signed his deal with DC to do the Man of Steel, 
the re, you know like the retelling of Superman's origin. Yeah, the first arc. Yeah, one of the yeah. one of the enticements Many that DC that Jeanette had thrown at him was that he could write the treat a treatment for the fourth Superman movie. Wow, no guarantee, was no guarantee that it would happen, but it was basically written as a treatment, and then it went into, you know, a bake off so to speak with a couple other pitches and Christopher Reeves pitch wound up, you know, getting chosen, which was the kind of nuclear thing. And uh, yeah. Yeah. You uh, know, as you said earlier, and, and, and no, I forgive me if there's more, more detail on that, I want you to finish your story. No, that's pretty much it was just, I, I know that when a couple of years ago, somebody had asked online, they were like, someone had asked burn, even on one of it on his, his burn victim site or whatever. Yeah, his said, was, this work. Treat, was this supposed to be a treatment for the movie? And he said he, it wasn't. And I immediately, I saw somebody had said, hey, Byrne said this wasn't. And I was like, wow, did I remember that wrong? So I was looking through my files and I found the script for it. You know, the original plot that Kurt had worked from. And sure. uh, when I found that at the top, it's printed out, treatment for Superman 4, <laughs> right at the, in his header. So it was like, okay, so John is remembering it differently. Uh, I respect that. Yeah. Well, the cool thing is, we didn't get those movies made, but just like uh, that, you know, Elliot Elliot Magan's uh, Last Son of Krypton story right. and Miracle right. Monday, those are great novels. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, thank God they exist. So, you know, and also I was going to say about Superman 4, um, Art Balthazar, I don't know if you've ever had this conversation with Art, but Art is like, that's like, there's a lot of great stuff in Superman 4, as bad of a movie as it is. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so true. It's there's a lot of great Clark Kent stuff in there. Yeah. I love even what he's when he's even like kind of you know uh, Mariel Hemingway has a big thing for Clark in the movie, and right. there's all these great scenes of just Clark being a good guy right, and right. being nice to her, but you know kind of not even aware of the fact that it's like, hey, dude, this this woman really likes you, right, right. Well, <laughs> but also like selling the farm. You know, yeah. I thought that was a really interesting little nod yeah. and things well, like there's that. A, there's a, the the heart of it is again like with the other ones too. There's there's a good chunk of it like the scenes with him and Margot Kidder, you know, the Lois Lane Clark when Clark is feeling ill and he's got this radiate some kind of poison yes. from a nuclear man or whatever. Um, those scenes are like really good, and that's really the origin of her. You know, we used it in the comic basically, but that's the origin of him kind of revealing his identity in a way and her, I mean, I don't remember the movie exactly, but the feeling was within their little interaction, you got the sense, I don't remember if she said she knew he was Superman, but there was something in there, like some germ of that, that I remembered where it felt like she was implying it to him. Like that's how you could read the scene. Someone's going to correct me because I haven't watched it in so many years. But well, it was almost a reverse of the amnesia kiss. Yeah. Where at, you know, while while they're kind of in the zone, yeah. she must have these memories suppressed, yeah. and they are still inside of her. But when we when we did the the engagement issue, um, Superman, you know, Clark and Lois getting engaged. When we planned it all out, I had suggested the idea. It's like, hey, why don't they get engaged? And I was thinking. They've been dating for like 50 or 70 so now like at the time it was 50 years so it's like they could be engaged for 50 years they could break up it didn't mean they would get married so it didn't feel like it was as mind-blowing or big of a change as maybe comic fans would have thought i felt like that's something he could easily have gotten out of but the idea was in the superman 50 that i wrote and um i had a bunch of different artists worked on that including burn and Kurt Swan and, and yeah, uh, it's like everybody, but I did the main part of the story where she he basically loses his powers in a previous issue due to red kryptonite and uh, and Mr. Mixius Pitlick. And uh, yes, <laughs> he goes to Lois with this ring, he goes to Smallville. Ma Kent gives him the family engagement ring, you know, from his whatever some member of his family, whether it was hers or her, you know, something like that. So he comes back to Metropolis at the end of the issue. He's going to propose to her. And in the original plot, she says, no, I'm not ready for that. Right. So when I was working on the pages, I was drawing the pages and, and doing the scripting. I got to that page and I said, you know, this doesn't feel right. It feels like she would say yes. After all the buildup, it feels like the honest thing would be for her to say yes. 
And so I immediately called up Mike Carlin and I said, uh, I may have a, you know, a little change here. And he was like, what? And I said, I want her to say yes. So when they get it, that they're going to get engaged. And he goes, huh, okay. And I said, I think it feels right. It feels honest. And he goes, yeah, you're right. Go with it. He said, but now I got to go call Roger Stern because Roger was writing action comics, which comes out the week afterwards. And Roger had to basically re configure whatever he was planning for that because he had to do the reveal, you know, he had to have Clark reveal that he's Superman because they wouldn't start their relationship on a lie. Right. But, but, it, but it's the type of thing where you, you don't really go into it. You know, the safe way would have been for that, for her to say no, just like she rebuffed him all these other years, you know, sure. over the years. But sure. um, we had the ability and DC had enough faith in us at the time that they basically, it wasn't something that required 25 people to sign off on. It was a call to Mike Carlin and Mike Carlin going, okay, yeah, that, that sounds good. That sounds right. And that's how it happened. And, you know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't as, I mean, I don't mean this as a bad thing, but it wasn't a corporate decision. You know, even the death of Superman, we had to get approval, but we didn't have to get approval from Warner Brothers. We got approval from Jeanette Kahn and Paul Levitz and Dick Giordano. They had to say, OK, you know, um, that's that's so interesting in contrast to what Denny O'Neill and Jim Starlin told me when they killed Robin. I mean, it wasn't even Batman. You know, they killed Robin. And it's like, you know, everybody upstairs is like, what are you doing? And it's like, don't worry, there's going to be another Robin. You're killing Robin. And poor Jim Starlin's the one who, uh, you know, got the got the sack and everything because of it. That's that's you know that sucks. So that's interesting to hear because, and again, correct me. Um, you know, I know obviously on Lois and Clark they were angling towards the marriage, and I had assumed that it was coming from corporate, where it's like, well, they're doing it on TV. We got to do it in the comics. No, the only thing that happened with that, and it was at the time we were mad, was the death of Superman came about because. And again, the memories are, some memories are good. Other ones are just part of 30 years old. But um, sure, man. when we had come in, I guess, into the Superman plotting session and we spent a day plotting the lead up to the wedding and the wedding that would have happened like in Superman 75 or whatever. And at the end of that first day, when we took a break and we went out to dinner and all that, we got like a, I think it was the next morning when we came in, my Carlin said, we got to put the wedding on hold. And we were, I think my thought was, oh, did this come from DC? Because he said the Lois and Clark people are thinking they like the idea of the engagement and they're thinking that they'd like to do the wedding on TV. And Mike's point was, again, this is when Superman sales were decent, but not stellar, right? Mike says, if they're going to do the wedding on TV, we can save the wedding to do in conjunction and we'll get much more of a, of a splash with it. So we were disgruntled. And I think we felt like maybe this was coming from Lois and Clark, but in, in the essence, it was coming from Mike Carlin making a gut decision that, you know, if we're looking for ultimately a sales boost, we're going to get a bigger boost from a TV show that's popular than, you know, so anyways, then we come in and we're all disgruntled and that, you know, therefore you get the death of Superman, you know, <laughs> which rocked the sales and rocked right. the world. And, and that pissed off. You know. I mean, of all things, we had no control over how it took hold or took root among the media and among fans. We put something out there and people grabbed it and took it. They, they ran with it. When the yeah. book came out, I mean, we, I remember hearing this was like Warner Brothers was like, hey, what are you doing? Kind of like with the Robin thing. It's like, wait, what are you doing? We're trying to plan another Superman movie. You guys, you know, so it was like, well, but, uh, but yeah, it's funny. Again, you, you know, all this stuff becomes kind of a, a thing that you, you know, you, you think back on and you go, so many elements had to fall into place, but we had a really supportive structure. It wasn't like a bunch of, you know, like, it was me at that point. It was me. Dan Jurgens was doing um, Adventures Super. Or, yeah, we'd. Yeah, no, I'd switched back to Adventures because I was just writing it. I'd stopped drawing it. I was doing it with Tom Grummet. Jurgens took over Superman. Uh, Roger Stern was doing action with. Uh, I want to say Bob McCloud was still on action at that point. Okay. 
penciling action. Um, and then uh, Bogdanov and Wheezy were doing the Man of Steel. So we had, yeah. it wasn't like four people fighting each other. You know what I mean? This was, it was, we, yeah. had, our, we had our disagreements, but ultimately the goal was to make better Superman comics. And we had this great structure and a, a good editorial basis. Mike Carlin was the final say on everything. But we had support from uh, Jeanette and support from Dick and support from Paul Levitz. And so it wasn't like we were feeling, you know, we felt like we were wanted and we felt we felt like we were, you know, respected that, you know, they, they trusted us to do this stuff, you know. And Absolutely. That's what and yeah. again, in a yeah. situation like that, it's a nurturing environment in a way. It's still competitive because we are always trying to do, uh, you know, we wanted to be competitive with each other. Sure. Um, so you all, everybody gave their their all, but ultimately it was a, just a really good environment to to do stuff in. There was no cutthroat stuff. It was it was just basically a a good creative you know work uh, environment. Agreed. Jeff Dyer points out that the wedding issue is getting a 25th anniversary hardcover release, so that's yeah. great. And yeah, yeah funny, for, you know, for for many years. I mean, I know Dan Dan DiDio did not like the idea of a married Lois and Clark or whatever for a long time, and he tried to he's tried his best to undo it. But I think the fans ultimately kind of went out in a situation like that because, you know, it was pro it was brought back in in convergence and uh, yes, you know, it kind of took hold, uh, which is good. Again, it's a show of strength for the idea itself, which uh, is nice. And they're DC's doing a a new. Um, collection of that so uh i scanned a bunch of uh pencils you know photocopies of pencils and some of the original art that i had for that and i think dan sent in some stuff we we basically they're, they're going to do some kind of extras you know in the book itself like a special section or something and is that for the wedding or is that for convergence yeah. oh it's okay great yeah. okay great because because truly no i agree and if anything you guys proved what jerry siegel was trying to do you know, back in the late forties or whatever, because there's that great unused script where right. Clark does reveal himself to Lois. And it's like, Hey, we're a team moving forward. Yeah. And then, and that is really like Lois is the one character that has Clark's back always. Yeah. Yeah. And I loved what uh, Rucka and Mike Perkins did in their Lois mini series. Yeah. Yeah, and and nice. I mean, God, literally for 16 years doing word balloon, I'm like, we need a solo Lois Lane book. Yeah. That's how strong she is. Yeah. And I understood what they wanted to do with the new 52, but it, it actually diminished Lois. And then, you know, and, and that's no fault of Gene Yang or everyone else that was writing the new 52 version of Superman. But it really was like, hey, man, no, this they need to be together. Yeah. And I mean, and, you know, yeah, I mean, you want conflict and you want uncertainty from your stories. You want to provoke that kind of emotion of, well, no, I, I mean, but but instead of making it, uh, I'm say, saying this for myself, as opposed to I want to know what happens next, I'm like, this isn't Superman. Right. And, and I stopped reading it. Thank God Convergence brought the, the, the version of the character that we all love, and it evolved into what we've got now. And hats off to Jurgens and Pete Tomasi and uh, Pat Gleason yeah. and, and Bendis, uh, you well, know, we, continuing and, F, and the current run. Lee Weeks and, and Dan did that, uh, you know, first bunch of those, you know, out of convergence and it was, it gave it a, a good solid basis. Um, I think sometimes though, you know, the, the, in, I've been in comics too long in a, in a way, um, every couple of years back, especially back in the eighties through the early two thousands. And I don't know if they're still feeling this way. They probably are, but every couple of years they want to reinvent stuff. And I totally, I do understand that, but a lot of times the reinventions wind up being unnecessary. In other words, like in the old days, you, there's a point where backstory can become baggage, just like with me or you, you know, oh, here's what happened to me and, you know, what, when I was 25. And, but then you think how much of that does affect you now? Some of it does, but again, like memories, you probably forget 90% of what happened. You remember 10% within continuity. There's really no reason to me. I don't think there's a big reason to wipe stuff clean and start over because you have the ability to reflect on something that might've happened 
but you don't have to. In other words, 70 years of Superman basically establishes what Superman is about, how the character would handle himself in a situation. Everything else is dressing, right? And you change that. So that stuff reflects the times. The character himself, he's already, he's already baked. That character is already what he's supposed to be. <laughs> yep. Your job as a new writer on Superman is to say, figure out what makes this guy what he has been for 70 years. That's your job. And then you put new dressing on it. You, you, you freshen it up by putting new villains or you do something that couldn't have been done in 1950 or 1960 or 80 or whatever. Something that comes from today, you can apply that. And, and the best, I think the best writers know that. So there's no reason. It, it feels like a cheat to take a character and wipe it and start fresh. And the New 52, especially, I never warmed to it. I don't. I think there were good books done during the New 52, stuff I enjoyed reading. But ultimately, it was like a what if or a tangent universe stuff. You know, it never felt yes. it never felt real enough because you took all those characters back to their beginnings. There's a point where, again, we don't need to reinvent Superman. You know. Um, and Superman, just one example, Captain Marvel, Shazam, whatever, those things are all the, they're all tried and true concepts. The character that doesn't change as much as the trappings, you know, um, Superman, you can look at a 60s Superman or say a 70s one is better. And you see uh, Clark Kent wearing bell bottoms, right? That's your change. That's the 70s. That's your, you know what I'm saying? It's like, he still has to be the character. Otherwise, he's not Superman. I'm with you. Well, of course, or you guys Batman had the mullet. Or, or you had the mullet Superman. Superman. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's <laughs> any of those characters. So I just, I, that's my two cents. I always, I, I understand that I was part of a revamp with Superman. Sure. Um, I was part of a revamp with Shazam, except with Shazam, I purposely left it open so that stories could be fit in if people, someone who really liked the Justice League appearances then yeah those happened before issue one or whatever you know i mean there was a way to work it that it didn't have to be an absolute and uh so unfortunately in for man of steel was great that burn did and it was great to kind of give yeah. it a fresh retelling of the origin and, and and all that but it didn't necessarily have to be a ground up restarting of everything and burn even wasn't like 100% on that. He was happy with, you know, I remember talking to him about it. It was like DC felt like it was a better thing to make it a whole new thing. He was kind of on the fence about that, you know. He took a lot of heat for that. Yeah. It really wasn't his call, you know. Wow. But, uh, but you know, again, I like the tapestry and I like the idea mm -hmm. of stories, you know, and, you know, things that happen to characters that, like Spider-Man holding up the, you know, being trapped under the machinery while Aunt May is sick and he can't get her his, her me, her medicine and all that, <laughs> you know, the, all the character building things, those things should still exist. Totally, but, I couldn't agree more. Absolutely, Jeff Dyer says your Captain Marvel is the best modern run of the character. What did you think of the Shazam movie? And any thoughts on the next Shazam movie? I feel like the first one, I liked it. I really enjoyed it. I think the first one, as much as it was based on on uh, Jeff Johns and Gary Frank's um, re retelling or whatever, it had the vibe that I was going for, you know. And that 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 sounds like a vague thing, but like when you watch something, it felt like it had the right vibe, serious, but also whimsical. And I tried to do that in the in the comic. I tried to make it yeah serious, but not depressing. Serious. Yes. Yes. You know, it was like, here's a character. Here's why he smiles. <laughs> you know? Yeah. The world can be falling down around you. There's going to be somebody who's going to it's the, always look on the bright side of life, you know? <laughs> um, so that, that the movie felt like it worked on that level. The second one, I don't really know. I mean, I have, I keep hearing about the, you know, the, uh, it's like the War of the Gods or that type of thing. It could be fun. I mean, it, it's probably going to be fun. It's the same basic people doing it. You know, so um, I, I'd be happy to, I'm happy, I'm anxious to see it. I'm more curious about what's happening with Black Adam. Me too, man. <laughs> you know, I mean, I no, think it'll I be agree. interesting. I think it'll be good. 
but I'm, I'm curious in a way of just how that, uh, <clears throat> how all the pieces work, whether it's going to be based kind of on the JSA storyline. I mean, I feel kind of like, I, and again, I'm not trying to overstep, but I feel proprietary towards the Black Adam character because a lot of the stuff that I did in the Shazam series, um, I don't remember if it was James Robinson or if it was when Goyer was still doing the JSA, but it was definitely Robinson and, and Jeff Johns. They basically took that and ran with what I kind of set up in the uh, the later issues of Shazam with uh, Black Adam being kind of more of a, anti-hero and, and trying to redeem himself from killing Billy's parents. <laughs> yeah, but, but absolutely. I feel, I feel a little proprietary towards it. Like, you know, it still feels kind of like my, you know, some of the work that I did may have some bearing on it. Um, I have one funny observation, which I just think is, it cracked me up. I've been seeing these pictures of, of the rock working out for the movie and he's got so many ropey veins all over his body. It's just like, it's crazy. Like he looks like a, uh, I'm trying to think of what artist I could think of was the uh, Liam Sharp or, uh, you know, that kind of like overwrought muscular veiny thing. Um, and it cracked me up because I'm thinking like, wait, he's going to wear a costume. The veins aren't going to show. But then I, <laughs> again, one of the movies, actually one of the trailers we saw with Black Widow was for Jungle Cruise. Is that Jungle Cruise, the thing that he's, the Disney movie that Dwayne Johnson's yeah. doing? Oh, yes, yes, yes. There's a picture of him with his little captain's hat, and he's got like a, a t shirt, kind of short, cut off t shirt. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, holy crap, that shirt has to be made with the thinnest material ever because I could see that one vein protruding through, through the shirt. That's fantastic. <laughs> wow. Jesus. <laughs> it's like, are they. Are they like digitally mapping clothes onto them now? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if they do that with Black Adam, it's gonna be it's gonna be really like a comic book character because comic book characters with their musculature and it's like you never really see wrinkles and things like that. It's just all the muscles, like right. the costumes painted on or whatever. That would be very funny. A hundred percent, man. No, I and it you know it's funny because he's he's a, I, I I wish he could also be Namor. Because yeah. I think he'd make an incredible name or as well. Maybe a little too big, but I just think his his uh, Samoan features. I believe he's Samoan. Forgive me, folks, if he's not. Uh, but yeah, I think yeah, you no, know he, really he does. Oh well, there you go. Then yeah, it just lends itself perfectly. Oh God, Retro Collector says Power of Shazam was a refreshing change of pace during absolutely the grim and gritty nineties. Hell yeah, man! And also it gave you a chance to really flesh out Fawcett City and beyond. Uh, the Marvel family, yeah. man, I just, anytime Bullet Man or any yeah. of those other Fawcett heroes showed up, I was excited as hell. Well, I like, I mean, I was, that was one of the things because DC at that point, I think they bought the Shazam property from Fawcett, Lock, Stock and Barrel before I did, when I did the graphic novel, that was around the time. But then I think right around the time of the series, they bought the other properties. So Spy Smasher, Bullet Man, you know, was it Mr. Crimson, Mr. Uh, Mr. Scarlet, Scarlet, right? Mr. Yeah, Scarlet yeah. Scarlet and Pinky. Yes, and Pinky, absolutely. And Minute, Minute Man. They Minute Man, those, yes. They had those characters too. So I, I made a point of using them to kind of fill out the city and the idea of this history in Fawcett City. Basically, yes. If it was new. I was trying to retroactively plant it back, you know, dating back even into the 50s for uh, continuity. Um but it was fun. I mean, that was that's the fun thing about doing it is that, again, I was pretty much supported in I didn't you know, like every idea I came up with, not everything was, you know, smooth sailing. But, you know, I felt like I could throw stuff out there, even if it was dumb. And my Carlin would say, yeah, too dumb or that's too far. But I mean, we did the Hoppy the Marvel Bunny story. We had, you know, Captain Marvel Shazam pulling him out of the of the magician's hat and all that i mean that would have i was in such a bubble at the time i mean if i was only worried about my legacy and my career i probably would have not done a happy story you know but i was just thinking about what would be fun what would be fun to read and and a lot of those ideas will like what would what, what will make mike carlin laugh you know a lot of the <laughs> uncle dudley stuff there was a, a lot of stuff that was thrown in there as a way to to get a rise out of Mike and to 
you know. <laughs> I I can appreciate that definitely. I'm uh here and you know I you know I told you it'd be an hour and I know we're at ni almost ninety minutes now, but I wanted to acknowledge some of the other great uh, stuff of yours that I pulled. Um, first of all, really excited uh, that they're doing the Batman eighty nine thing, and this is your cover for mm -hmm. that. Yeah, it's an, I think it's a variant for the first issue. Awesome, and yeah, I didn't I didn't realize, and it makes sense that they're moving forward. And uh, you know, we had uh, Billy D as uh, Harvey Dent, and we didn't get him as Two Face in the movies, but it, obviously it's coming in the comic, and that makes a lot of sense. And another Batman image that I love that you did uh, that you that you inked over um, Gil Kane, and yeah. it's a great image. I love yeah, it. Was this. A, my my buddy Pat, who used to own Cave Comics. He had this Gil Kane thing. It was a marker sketch hanging up on his wall with all his other Batman art. And at one point he said, is there any way you could like re-ink this or restore it or something? And I, I looked at it. I took it out of the frame and I said, I can't like as a try to restore it, cover every go over every line. I said, but here's what I could do for you is I'll take your artwork. I'll print it out on blue line and I'll give you a new inked version. And then wow. I'll also take the Gil Kane version and I went in Photoshop and I changed levels and, and stuff. And I got the, cause the line art, he'd use a flare pen or something in this, in sure. whatever it was. And because it was hanging in a frame in, not in just direct sunlight, but just sunlight or light is going to fade it. I took yeah. the, in Photoshop and I changed levels and cleaned it up. So I gave him like a, a scan of what the art would have looked like or, you know, originally, but I couldn't have, Unfortunately, saved it. It it, uh, it was a shame, but uh... <laughs> Stevie go. Agnew remembers, so yep. that's cool. I uh, one of my local shops in Chicago, Alley Cat, uh, is a great shop, and they have a great Shazam commission that you did for them, and oh, it's probably I, behind I, the cash register. Yeah, yeah, I did a I did a sketch for them. Um, I think I did it for I got comics in exchange. I think. It was one, I forget what I was ordering. I think I ordered a bunch of Infinity Inks from them because I didn't have like the later issues. And I think they, the, op, the so someone contacted me, say, hey, would you do a sketch for the store? And I did the sketch instead of, you know, sending a check. <laughs> I hear you. Absolutely. Hey, and speaking of Infinity Ink, you know, we're only a couple weeks away from season two of Star Girl. Oh yeah. And obviously all the exposition. Again, Jer, I am not your accountant and forgive the question if it's too personal, but I certainly hope that uh you'll be compensated uh for what you did with Infinity Inc. uh, uh coming up on the show. And if not, we need to get you the right uh attorneys <laughs> and uh, tap tap you know Warner's on this on the shoulder and go, uh I think uh I think somebody did a lot of work uh that's the groundwork for this uh Sadly, We're just making Star Girl. The, the TV shows don't pay very much, unfortunately. Oops. The TV shows are basically, uh, I mean, if you do stuff for like the, if uh, Adam Smasher, which who, character formerly known as Nuclon, if Nuclon, just him being in the the Black Adam movie, that triggers a, a character equity payment to me and Roy and Mike Macklin. Um, but uh, the TV stuff is pretty sad. Unless, I mean, I'm sure if, if it was an Infinity Inc. show, just like Black Lightning, uh, Tony Isabella and, and Trevor Von Eden got money for that because it was a it was a show. But when you have a guest appearance, like they've used characters in The Flash, they use, you know, a lot of stuff. And it really does. It's, it's nothing that's going to, you know, maybe you can get a, I can take Mitch out for pizza. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we can do our pizza podcast or whatever, but... It's 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 pretty puny. So well, that set is here. Exciting. I mean, it's exciting to see you know Jade, and possibly Obsidian will be in there too. So you know. Yeah, I certainly hope so. Hey, what do you think? You know, honestly, and and, uh, and I, I bring it up because I want people to know that uh, I can I I, I am uh, uh, open to differences when uh when initially when they when earth 2 again during the new 52 and they de-aged the justice society and they had alan scott suddenly be gay i'm right. like well just invent a, another gay you know I'm, I'm totally cool with there being a gay green lantern but why does it have to be alan scott but i love what james tynan has done and now what they're doing and saying no alan was gay in the 40s and i'm like well now that's interesting yeah. and that i do want to read and also 
uh, having a, a gay son in Obsidian. It's like, this is really interesting now. And I really am legitimately excited about the story possibilities yeah. of even looking back at the classic JSA and, and having Alan worry about two secret identities, if you right. will. Right. See, I mean, I'm, when when they first, like when the Obsidian was first, you know, revealed as gay in the, I think it was in the Manhunter comic. I believe you're right. Um, I was maybe a little bit, I mean, it's, here's the th the problem is, and this is what happens when you work for co big companies is you do a character, you do create something, you have no control over it. In other words, sure. like DC hasn't allowed me to do anything with any of these characters, you know, Bibbo or any of these characters that nobody yeah. seems they claim to not care about gang. I would Bibbo. love to do stuff with them. Yeah. I get no say in it. So you have yeah. to stand on the sidelines and you you watch other people do stuff with it and it feels weird so it's not like that I don't have a pro that I have a problem with them changing a character as much as it's a little bit of a twinge of like uh I have I have no control over it. You know sure. what I mean? Yeah. It's more of that. Um with with Alan Scott the character I mean I think Roy did more to make him a little more real in all-star squadron and then in infinity inc i mean i think he did more to make that character a little less two-dimensional than he was i mean in the old comics a lot of those characters sure. are pretty uh you know like green lantern he's got the cool powers and stuff but you know is he interesting as a character like clark kent is interesting as a character or whatever you know not all of them are great no doesn't mean they're terrible but they just comics weren't developed like that back then. Yeah, you know they yeah. were they were not uh, they didn't have that level of it. So I think Roy brought some interest to the character. He brought some interest in having, you know, an offspring that he didn't know about, and that whole storyline was interesting. But as for as, as far as the sexuality, someone can go, oh look, he had a, you know, he had a love interest in these old comics or whatever. Right. But he married he you, married uh, the Harlequin even. He but married if you're, to, if you're trying to do a comic. And again, you always want to try to freshen stuff up or make it relevant in some way or another. I don't think it's a terrible thing, but I do, I, I do, I do side with the come up with your own character more than because it's almost like stunt casting in a way. You know what I mean? It's like I a, do. You're using something that's already established to help sell your new idea, as opposed to coming up with something interesting and building it from the ground up. And they could have done that at any point. Now, they could have done that with a Green Lantern, even in yeah. the JSA book, if someone wanted to. They've had 70 years to do something like that, which they could have done. So, you know, but but again, I understand that people like representation, and I, I totally get that, whether it's racial representation or sexual orientation representation. It's someone wants to have some, something reflect them as an audience, you know? So I mean I get it and I'm I'm for it in that way. I just I still do think like like if we see a black superman it's not going to ruin the world and it's not going to no. ruin the character but in a way it's it is to me it still feels like a little bit of stunt casting and I use that term it's like having you know having Sean Connery in Robin Hood you know or whatever there's a point where you're building off of something that's already popular and you're creating a little bit of controversy or surprise for an audience as opposed to, you know, coming up with an actually interesting character from the ground floor, which the original, the New 52 Earth 2 kind of did that. They kind of were new characters, you know? Yes, um, James explained that. That's how James Robinson told me when I talked to him. And I'll be honest, I was like, what the hell, man? Yeah. And not in any mean confrontation, it's just I don't understand. Yeah. And he said, well, yeah, he goes, this isn't 1940s Alan Scott. This is a different Alan Scott. And and building on what you said about Black Superman, um, I, I think it's a missed opportunity where we could have gotten another Kryptonian yeah. because they've, we've already established for decades yeah. that there were people of color on Krypton. Yeah. So yeah. why not have a Black Krypton, yeah. a different... I, I It's the same thing about, um, and I think you and I might have had this conversation, but it's uh, Star Trek Discovery making... The lead character Spock's sister, and it's like, oh yeah, why not instead have her be raised by a different Vulcan family, yeah. and then you could have Sarek and Michael Burnham's other right. Vulcan father, 
right. you can have a very interesting philosophical discussion about yeah. raising children on Vulcan right. and, and the right. differences between humans and Vulcans. Absolutely. But again, you don't get the same, you don't get the same story impact. And I do think, and this, I don't mean this to be in a sound like a bad thing, but you know how they used to they used to say like a even um, even negative press is still press. Sure. In a way, the environment that exists for the last ten years. Yeah. Especially with the internet thrown in and all the views of social know, media. Was, yeah. I mean, when you when you think of it, doing stuff like that is, I think it's interesting because it is a pro provocation to the fans who are the the hardcore inflexible fans yeah it's clearly a provocation so but it, i mean it's it's worth it's worthwhile as a story element but it is there is that double-edged sword it's like okay sure. her story becomes more important by her being spock's half sister or whatever than it does from a, fa a family connection you know what i mean but by yeah. the same token it also well this will get people talking and we want they people don't to care in a way you know they don't yeah they don't seem to care if it's bad press or, you know, whatever, as long as people are talking about it. It's a weird time. I mean, think about that. It's such a weird time. In the old days of, of, of anybody who, a license, a license holder of, you know, the Lone Ranger or whatever character would be horrified to have people, you know, go off on a tangent and hate a character that, that you know, everybody wanted everybody to like. So these characters had to be kind of like broad-based you know, interest wise, they couldn't be too specific because some party will not like it, which means maybe that those people won't buy it. And that was the bottom line is we want as many people liking and buying this as possible. Now, we're, I think because there's so many channels and there's so many, you know, different universes and all that, that they can take a shot at yes. alienating somebody because they know that maybe they'll gain somebody else. So anything everything's fair and you know it's you can't think of any of these things in the way we would have in the 60s you know like in the 60s you if you cast superman superman had to have black hair and, and yeah if you cast a green arrow he had to have blonde hair you know and that stuff none of that stuff exists anymore they don't give a shit <laughs> you know you're right you're they right really care. They, they, I always said, jimmy Olsen, how many jimmy olsons have been cast with our archie andrews that are guy yeah. his hair you know, right or or you know yeah Mark McClure it. Mark McClure didn't have to dye his hair red to be a great Jimmy Olsen in the Donner films. But it's so you it's funny imagine you're like that you know you're you're Seth Green and you're going ah finally I get to play Jimmy Olsen they're making a movie and it's like wait why would they cast that guy he's got black <laughs> hair that's my one part I've got freckles I've got red hair <laughs> that's awesome uh, Ga I think Gail Simone on Twitter months ago is like cast the Justice League in the 60s. And I'm like, Jack Cassidy should have been Ollie Queen. I think 1960s Jack Cassidy would have been a fantastic Ollie Queen. Yeah, that's true. Even the attitude and everything wow. that he had. Yep. And I wanted uh, I wanted Jerry Van Dyke to be Barry Allen. Oh, that's Because I think when he's on the Dick Van Dyke show, it's like, yeah. oh, I can see him being uh, Barry Allen. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. So, that's pretty you funny. Know, and, of course, you've got you know Newman as Green Lantern, you know, as uh, – you know, the original artists were, you know, the Silver Age artists were, were doing them that way. Yeah. I want to also, I noticed uh, on eBay, you're selling this fantastic uh, sketch that you did of Wonder Woman, right? Yep. Awesome, man. Put, put that up last night. I think it ends next Monday night. I mean, so I, don't do any, I don't do any color commissions, so I do these, and they're just kind of fun to play with the Copic markers. I like the Copics. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I put too much into it. And I know that, you know, there's no easy uh, compare. Like you, you could, I put up some of these things and I put a lot of work into them. And I think, well, I hope this goes for a lot of money because I put in, you know, seven hours drawing it and coloring it or whatever. And then the one that you did for three hours winds up, you know, making more. And then you go, <laughs> you can't predict it. But, no. Uh, but it's fun. I mean, I like, I always like working in color and, and I was, uh, even thinking back, like with this, that Superman painting, that thing was done in 1979. You know, the painting that everybody was uh, retweeting. Yeah. And it was, <clears throat> this was done while I was working at an art studio. And I did, I used to do samples to try to get work within the studio for them to see me as more of an illustrator type. But I was 
they're basically they were learning samples too. Um, that one was painted with oil glaze. The uh, wow. there's actual line work, and I I think I tweeted the line art of it. I did it as a line art piece, and then I just I transferred the line art to a heavy cold press um, illustration board, and then I used uh, oil glazes with uh, wow. um, it, something that I, I was always fascinated with by the uh, um, the painters of the you know the early commercial guys that uh, had different techniques and um, I so the 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 head shots all the heads. The Superman character in the middle is painted with opaque oils, but all the other characters are painted almost with like a wash effect with uh, oil paints and and, a, and like a clear glaze medium that, that you put in just so that they don't have too much coverage. So it's, you know, the, the characters work or the, you know, likenesses all work well in line art. So I figured uh, I didn't really want to cover them up and I liked the, the, the line art. It was done in pencil. I like that aspect of it too. So I wanted some of it to show through. So it's kind of a weird hybrid, but. Uh, um, so effective. Yeah, I think I did. I did several pieces based on that movie. I did a color piece on. I did a, those were, that was done in Dr. Martin's dyes with a little Prismacolor uh, pencil. Wow. Um, and it's faded. Originally was much more vivid back in uh, 1979. I did a Hulk one. I mean, I did the TV Hulk, Lou Ferrigno and Bill Bixby. I did, I did a Wonder Woman with uh, Linda Carter. I did a uh, um, Close Encounters, again like a montage scene. And again, they were just me practicing, you know, thinking like, oh, if I got to do a movie poster. And some of them were better than others. Like the Close Encounters one, I hadn't seen in years, and I found it in one of my flat files, and I thought. It's kind of, you know, like maybe 30% of it I like and the rest of it I don't. Um, <laughs> but uh, the Hulk one is actually pretty halfway decent, I think. It, it it was pretty good. And at one point I was like, what do you do with it, though? You know what I mean? <laughs> just I wound up just putting it back in, a, in the flat file, you know? Um, well, I'm thinking is, is 62 when the Hulk debuted or was it this year? I think it's 62. Oh yeah. Yeah. 62. So exactly. next year, next year is the 60th anniversary. So fantastic four were at what? 80, right? I mean, yes. Yeah. Or no, uh, 80, 60. I mean, uh, 60. fantastic four, 61. So yes. Fantastic four. No, the, yeah. Was yeah. The Hulk 62 or was he 61? I'm going to look it up while we're talking, but um, I know yeah. So. I'm not... Go ahead. Yeah. No, I was going to say, I think Spider-Man would have been, like the amazing fantasy would have been, it feels like that would have been like 62. Daredevil might have been 63. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, again, we're, we're kind of, yeah, May of 62. Which one? May of 62 for the Hulk. Oh, okay, yeah. So, yeah, man, next year, uh, you know, hey, Marvel. When was the, uh, <laughs> I have to figure out when was the TV show, when did that debut? Was that 70? I think that was 77 or 78. Let's find out. I'll, uh, Let's see when yeah, that started. Right. Probably a little later. Yeah, I, I mean, again, I think that was, uh, yeah, uh, God, what a great series. Seriously, uh, there was that one episode of um, of the show that really is a combination of the most dangerous game and also Saw. Nineteen seventy. Okay, November 4th of 77. Yeah, okay. So, again, uh, next year is the 45th anniversary, I want to yeah. say. Everybody check my math or whatever. <laughs> but yeah, I thought, you know, so yeah. No, absolutely, man. Um, yeah, there you go. Boom for for uh so so it works for both, frankly. That's terrific. Um you this know, this one this one episode, it, it starts off like like the most dangerous game where it's a big game hunter and he and he captures uh David Banner, Bill Bixby, to hunt him, and then he sees him change, and he's literally like beyond excited he's like david i had no idea this is gonna be the greatest <laughs> hunt i ever had and he's leaving clues like in the saw movies on cassette tape saying all right you're in a death trap you got you know five minutes to get out of it or you know i'm gonna blow you up or whatever and i won't give away the ending if people don't remember it you really have to see it because it is the most disturbing ending of an incredible hulk episode and I and I did not see it coming, and I did not remember it from when, watching it as a kid. And I'm like, 
Wow. Very, very cool. So, yeah, man, that show had teeth. That show definitely had teeth when it wanted to. Can it top the Superman, the 1950s Superman, of him taking the, taking the people <laughs> who discovered his identity and putting him on the top of a mountain peak? <laughs> Probably not. Let them die, as William Shatner says. He didn't in, technically kill them. They no. and fell and died. <laughs> right. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, but he's still winking at the end of the episode and stuff. Yeah, and people are <laughs> mad about Man of Steel. Come on, Zod was destroying the city and trying to kill people. <laughs> I don't. I do not disagree with you at all, Jarrett. Great, great hangout, man. And I can't That's wait fun. to see you at Terrificon again. There's the dates: July 30th through August 1st, Mohegan Sun. And is that a is that a Mitch drawing or is that you? It's a Mitch drawing. Yeah. Mitch okay. Is on, very cool. Uh, He's he's been on his uh, Mitch budget because he did hasn't been able to do the show for two years. So totally understand. I love this one. Yeah, I love this image. I think well, I like, I I like to see him drawn. You know, I mean, he he. Uh, I, I picture he's him. And I, maybe I'm totally wrong, but I picture him like when we were maybe eight years old. That you're you know he's sitting there on on the carpet, laying on his belly with his crayons. You know, I picture him with his tongue sticking out of the corner of his mouth, <laughs> concentrating. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you guys do your podcast together, The Powers Cosmic, or The Power Cosmic, excuse yeah, me. Yeah, we just did one on Black Widow. We did it on the way there and on the way home, on the drive home um, last Thursday. I think he just put it up today. I saw that on Twitter. Days. Yeah. I hate that. We I always try to keep him from spoiling movies because I said, you know, even if we do, if you put this up on Monday, not everybody can go the first weekend. I haven't know, seen it yet. Especially, you know, you get those Tuesday matinees that are cheaper. Hey, come on. At least wait until Wednesday. <laughs> no, and honestly, Jer, I'm sure you feel the same way. And you guys are very eager to go out and see the movies as soon as possible. And, of course, Connecticut's one of those states that, you know, they really have uh, COVID in a good place or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but I really do think it's going to be very interesting watching uh, the, 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 you know, the Marvel movies, Snake Eyes, everything else. Those will do fine. But it's yeah. going to be really interesting to see just where movies are in general as yeah. we come out of COVID. Because I know a lot of people got really comfortable sitting at home watching streaming. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in fact, I'm even like, at first I'm like, all right, I guess I'll see Black Widow in the theater. And it's like, yeah, maybe I will actually stay home and watch it still. I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, I mean, it's not not cheap, but it's also not terrible. Oh, that's so yeah. funny. Uh, here, Mitch, like I thought there would be pizza. That's why I'm here. <laughs> Wrong all the way podcast. And he's like, he does still stick his tail when he draws. Very good. Hey, so. That's the mark of a true artist. <laughs> Absolutely, man. And uh, and also, real fast, I want to mention to everybody watching that uh, beyond uh, going to see Jerry and a lot of other Superman creators, I'm really excited about this thing Paul Kupperberg and I are doing. And we're presenting this amazing oh, cool. video presentation of, of Julie Schwartz from 1988. And he did. He had like a live slide presentation. And it really focused. It's Sunday afternoon. There you go. And um, it focuses on a lot of the Golden Age uh, national publication staff that was very instrumental in getting Superman out the, out the door and beyond Siegel and Schuster. Well, and, didn't and he? I, I'm just, re, I'm, again, I don't remember the seeing the, the presentation. I know he did it at, a, at shows back then. But I thought he had gone through archives because there's a, like a little he did a little book, a little book on his like an autobiography around that time. And I feel like he was researching it because I know he used to he would always ask me, like whenever I'd see him at a show, he'd say, hey, do you have any pictures of me from conventions <laughs> and stuff? Because I was always every time I went to a show, I used to have my camera and I wish I did that forever but i only i stopped doing it in the uh I, I did it through the 80s i would take a lot of pictures at conventions and then i didn't do a lot of shows when the kid my kids were little i didn't do a lot of travel sure. Sure. but then i got out of the habit of taking the camera with me everywhere but julie was always on the lookout when he was putting that together he was look, on the lookout for pictures from various shows and i remember he specifically wanted pictures of him and and this girl kim who was dc had hired as a wonder woman um model for oh wow I think it was 1985 85 was the anniversary dc anniversary from the first dc book i think so it, i think it was 1985 they had this wonder woman act uh model she was really great she was you know very she looked the part she was super nice 
and Julie was like, oh, you have any pictures of me and that uh, Wonder Woman? So I don't know if that wound up in this, but I'm pretty sure it wound up in his book because <laughs> I was always taking those pictures. Absolutely, man. No, that's cool. No, it's great. Uh, I'm really glad that Paul, literally, as he told me, it was sitting in uh, Julie's waste pa paper basket, this yeah. v VHS tape. Yeah, and I'm yeah. really glad Paul and Paul doesn't throw anything away, as you know. And it's <laughs> it's great that way. Thank God, man, because again, there's these little gaps in in the 20th century before the 90s. I, I lately I've been saying every fart since the 90s is recorded for posterity, like it or yeah. not. But before then, there are little gaps, and and also through that telephone of you tell one person and then goes right. to the next person and so on. Yeah. Sometimes the truth slips away. Yeah. And so it's Those really important that always, we have these things. I guarantee you, by the time that's told the third time, it has very little relation to what really happened. I mean, I've heard stories told back to me. Oh, no, this happened. This happened. I'm like, I was in the room when that happened. And that's not how it happened. <laughs> you know? Well, that's you, honestly. Did you see that? I think it was maybe two, three months ago. Somebody posted a link from YouTube on Twitter of Stan Lee doing a presentation for Marvel to try to get the sell cartoon stuff. It was for the Marvel superhero show. No, but it was him reading from a script, doing a presentation, basically selling the Marvel superheroes to, and I think part of it, one, one part of it was for general purpose to sell licensing for these characters. Sure. The, other, the first part of it is basically specific to the Marvel superheroes cartoon show. So it was from like 1966 when that cartoon show started. Yes. And it was really, it was, I had never seen it before. I think a friend of mine who's a big nut for this stuff, I sent him the link thinking, of course, he had seen it. And he goes, No, I saw it at a San Diego con in the screening room back in, you know, like 1989 or something that Stan Lee showed it or whatever. But he said he hadn't seen it since. So it was really cool to see it Ooh, we'll put up on, on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I'm again, totally looking at it. It's so cool because one of them is is him just talking to the camera, you know, giving a spiel about the the Marvel superheroes. And at the time when they were spieling, doing his spiel, yes, Spider Man was part of that original group of the Marvel superheroes shows. And then obviously Spider Man and the Fantastic Four had a, a side deal with ABC that came out in yep. '68. So they were they were pulled and and I think sub they submitted or they substituted Submariner in there but it was kind of cool like i said wow. this was at the beginning of that process so it was a just a neat little piece of history that again seeing stan kind of in his more subdued he was still the editor guy at the tie and everything it was just kind of funny you know yeah um, there's a there's a 1979 half hour uh, canadian television program called behind the scene and uh it sounds like it's jonathan winters narrating it and it's a big deep dive look at DC and Marvel. Oh, cool. And I I know it was turned into a um a school film. Uh -huh. Basically, I'm sure they were showing it to our classes, like, well, if you can draw, you know, this might be a right. career for you or whatever. Yeah. And and um there's a great scene um that I've put up of uh, Neil Adams, Julie, and Danny O'Neill uh going over uh the story for uh Superman versus Muhammad Ali. Oh, cool. And, and it starts with Mike Gold from 78 or 79 going into the DC archive and pulling out that first issue of Detective Comics with the Fu Manchu cover. Oh, cool. And um, and through my detective work, talking to everybody that I knew that was in the movie, um, I, you know, I'm like, wow, is it, you know, is this really like, did they actually capture this story session about Superman and Muhammad Ali? And Mike told me, and actually Neil and Denny ended up telling me, it's like, no, 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 that was a recreation. The book had come yeah. out the year earlier. But yeah, they yeah. even have, remember the DC hotline on the phone? Oh, yeah, yeah. They've got, uh, they got Joe Orlando touting <laughs> the first issue of Black Lightning and the first <laughs> issue of Jonah Hex as a solo uh, book instead of Weird <laughs> Western. Oh, it's so great. And I remember calling that thing and being chewed out by my parents. Like, it's 50 cents a call. Are you right, nuts? Right. Why that. are you yeah. wasting money? And hey, with the other, well, telephone, everything was expensive back then, too. You know, <laughs> I mean, I was thinking about how long, remember long distance was really expensive. Oh, my God, yes. By relation to anything else, long distance was such an exorbitant uh, treat. And for, totally. for years, my older brother, Mike, was in college. He would just, 
you know, when he'd leave, he'd be visiting. And when he'd go back, he'd say, I'll call when I get home. But he would call, he'd make a collect call for him. And then we would answer and we'd say, no, Mike Ordway's not here and hang up. But then you knew, oh, he got through. He's Absolutely, home. man. He's back yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, and I mean, good Lord, I had relatives that were still in Greece and stuff. And yeah, they'd, they'd shoot the works once a year for a five dollar call or whatever when five dollars you know really was big money and stuff well you yeah man no you're right it was a crazy world go ahead mentioning the dc hotline i was t mitch and i were talking about and he he didn't believe me but then he found uh he did actually find it on, on a google search i remember as a i wasn't a little kid i was maybe i i guess maybe eight or ten or something in that range a machine that's ven a comic vending machine and you put in what I remember was is comics were 12 cents at the time. You had to put in a dime and a nickel. So you paid 15 cents. And then you, it was like almost like those things you'd see in the diners where you, where they had the pages that would flip to play your music at your table. Yes. A little sure. Bit. It was that type of thing, but it had a total of maybe 10 titles and then you would choose the title and it would slide out. And he was like that, that wasn't a thing. And I said, yeah, it was a thing. It's, it wasn't a popular thing. So he found a picture of these machines and I was looking at it and going, that's not what I remember seeing. It was oh, the machine he had looked more like a like an old cigarette machine. It was kind of square and had eight titles. And I remember something with an actual plexiglass with a spinner or a rotating thing that you could look at all the the titles on. But it was it was wow. funny because then that made me remember that Saul Harrison back in the 70s, around the time of 73, 74, they tried that comic book van. There was a yes. van that would drive around and they were going to be able to sell comics from this van, like a ice cream truck. Yeah, or a bookmobile, sure. And they apparently, I think they only did it, they did test runs near and around Metropolis, Illinois. Oh, that's crazy the and funny. Comics were printed in Sparta. Back yes, then. of course. So it was like, you know, a test run of this. And I guess they actually painted up a van. And that's kind of funny. I mean, you think, of all the things, it would be really cool if someone somewhere saved that van, that that oh, van God. still existed with that paint job on it. Would that be a that would be a great thing to see at a comic convention? You know oh my I mean? God, yes, that's <laughs> hilarious. Uh, Stephen Commander says he loved you inking uh, Liefeld on Snake Eyes. That was fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, I've known Rob since he was. Uh, I hate to say since he was a kid, but yeah, when he was a kid, he was a kid. I, I, first <laughs> met, I met Rob. I met Hank Canals. And uh, uh, a Dallas comic convention in like 1985, and uh, they were just young kids, young punks, and they brought me donuts on the Sunday of the show. And I always remember, like, wow, they they found their way into my heart. <laughs> they brought me donuts. <laughs> oh, wow, that's funny. Yeah, bad. according to Jay Wilson, uh, Batman executive producer Michael Uslin drove one of the DC comic book models. I would watch a documentary on that. Oh God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, man. Uh, and yeah, he said, he said, oh, there were people who drove this around the country. Yeah, I don't know how far the, uh, you know, that might be a good Mike Gold question because again, he was with marketing in the late 70s. Yeah. He might actually know. I'm not sure. This, again, this happened, this happened in the Saul Harrison <clears throat> era. I think Gold came in when uh, Jeanette, a little later. Jeanette took over. So it would have been like okay. 72 through 74 ish. Okay, because I have seen photos of the van. Yeah. But people, people, what they don't realize or they don't think about now, you can go to a comic store, you buy your comics, or you can go to Comixology or whatever. But back then, it was really hard to pick up comics that uh, you would be able to, other oh, Bruce Hamilton too. It would be as hard to find comics every title. So if you bought a, a, a comic monthly, there was a good chance that one issue might not make it to your newsstand, your local newsstand or whatever. Totally. So, I spent my summers, I spent talking about riding your bike in the winter. I would ride my bike, you know, maybe 10 mile radius to any possible drugstore that could have comics. And I would run, I would do the, just a circle starting on Tuesday, going around looking for new gods or looking for something that was, <laughs> you know, like one of the main titles, because those things were always hard to find. So DC, everybody was trying to find ways to sell books back then. They did good with subscriptions, you know. Um, a lot of a lot of things were. It was just harder, and it, it made you really, I guess, appreciate those comics more. <clears throat> you know, putting about ten miles in uh, twenty degree weather on your bike, 
to get a copy of the beast in amazing adventures adventures or whatever <laughs> it's like that comic felt more special <laughs> oh i get it man absolutely you know i used to get those whitman uh bags of comics and you know the front and the back comic were always a popular title, yeah. and then the middle comic was always where mystery. monsters dwell. It was a mystery book, <laughs> yeah, or it was a mystery book or a western book. Well, I mean, you couldn't see what was in the middle, so it was a mystery. Right, book. right. Oh, I see. Yes, no, you're right about that too. I remember getting a a, a Hellstorm uh, Marvel book, and yeah, and it's like, wow, who's this character? Never heard of him. Of course, it was the middle of a story. Never found out how it resolved, and I was I, I was too young. I'm like, all right, well, whatever. And those uh, were magic. All bootlegs. Those were all bootlegs because they ripped the 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 titles right. off, and the titles yes. were sent back to the companies for credit. So the the newsstands, the dealers didn't have to pay for those as sold. But then they took those books to somebody who bagged them three in a bag and sold them at like bodegas and small stores. You are so right. Yes, <laughs> for a quarter, you'd get three books for a quarter or whatever. Magic K. Am I right? Wasn't the Death Metal Secret Origins? Didn't you do the Superboy Prime uh, book? Yeah, yeah. Jeff, yeah. Jeff Johns, he called me up. He said, you know, since I, I worked on a bunch of, I think whenever Superboy Prime was in any of those crossovers, he was in Blackest Night. He was in the Sinestro Wars. I did, I wound up doing those stories. So Jeff thought of me for the, you know, for that Secret Origins. That was a nice one. I enjoyed, the, I thought the, the book itself was really nice. I enjoyed reading it. And, uh, it was fun to do, you know, that, that character because he's – when Je Jeff is the guy who came up with that idea for that character, right? That character is the uh, abrasive, toxic comic fan. And when he first introduced them as in that incarnation, I guess, in, in uh, Infinite, uh, Infinite Crisis, I was like, wow, this is a great take. I mean, it was a great way of making that character different. Absolutely. at the center of – continuity that got blown up you know it was it was that was a good idea so i i have a a little soft spot for him so it was nice to see him get redeemed <laughs> well and and even when he was originally introduced in dc presents uh the superman team up book literally superman is just grieving the loss of supergirl in the original right. crisis and he shows up right and and he was this like oh that's great and it's a new superboy and isn't that interesting right. And then, yeah, like you said, what what they did with him in Infinite Crisis was hilarious. Yeah. And then, but it's great that that death metal story kind of redeemed him at the end. Yeah, yeah, pretty no, cool, man. It was it was definitely a, a heartwarming, heart tugging. But again, I mean, I always like to go with the. I'm sure it was I always attribute to Neil Adams. He used to always say, "There's no bad characters. There's you know just bad handling of characters." Right. And. It's true to a great, I mean, you could see it in uh, in practice all the time. You'll see somebody, here's a character nobody wanted to do, and then somebody will take it and make it into gold somehow, you know? Um, yeah. Tom King's been doing that both at Marvel and DC. I mean, I think his Vision min miniseries did that. And then also, even right now, he's wrapping up, and I've always loved Adam Strange, yeah, but the yeah. story he's telling with Adam Strange is a fantastic story. I just love it. Mike uh, Jones acknowledges in the UK, only place near me that had U.S. comics was the local post office. <laughs> Superman, Batman, and JLA comics, they always seem to skip an issue. Typically, this was during a lot of two-parters. Yeah, well, and again, for the UK fans having to get their books, I mean, the American books were literally ballast on ships yeah. Yeah. for weight purposes, and that's how they got over there. And yeah, I mean, you just happen to, you know, again, I love hearing from you know, Graham Morrison, James Robinson, and all the various, you know, Dave Gibbons, writers and artists, that that's how they got their DC books and stuff. It was yeah. very interesting. Yeah, I remember they, they also did, I mean, Dave, I remember talking to Dave about that. He was, he, he'd met, I think he's the first guy I heard talk about these comics being ballast on a ship, which is just a, amusing in a way. But it, it's, you know, uh, my first thought is like, imagine you, you know, none of these books had royalties back then, right? These were all like 60s, you know, 50s and 60s things. Work for <clears throat> But did the companies, were these returns? <laughs> you know what I mean? Did the company take a bath on them or were they actually ballast and then someone said, hey, I can sell these, <laughs> you know? Somebody yeah. Knew. I have a feeling it's the latter. I really do yeah, have a feeling that it was just kind of garbage that they're like, wait a minute, we can sell these. The military bases used to be a, a big market for comics too. And, uh, 
you know, they, my brother, when he was in the air force, he was stationed plenty of places overseas. And he would always like, I'd always ask him, Hey, do you see any comics? Do you see any mine or whatever? And it's just funny. Cause those, that was almost like, yeah, they, the soldiers were the only ones who could buy them because they were sold at the base Peter. store or whatever. Yeah. But they would leave them behind or give them away to kids wherever they were, you know? And, and that's, there's a universality, I guess, to the, the idea of a superhero for that reason, you know? You, I agree. We all want somebody to come in and swoop in and save us, you know? Totally. No, you're 100% right. And again, that's what makes comics as great as they are. So, Jerry, you've been incredibly kind with your time. I know it's after 10 year time right now. So, I don't, I, you know, again, you know, thanks as I always. To, I sacrificed watching Superman and Lois. You DVR'd it, I hope. I hope you DVR'd it. I did. I, I watch it. I'll watch it tomorrow on the. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Excellent. I totally forgot about it, though. I was like thinking, what's on Tuesday night? Oh, <laughs> damn it. No, I, well, I appreciate you taking the time and talking to me. Like I said, man, I've just been enjoying uh, the, the, the painting so much. And yeah. uh, we'll show it one more time and everything. And yeah, let's, uh, let's hope that, uh, sadly, with the passing of Donner, there's an excuse to uh, maybe uh, see these things in print. Well, and at least uh, we're seeing them here. And I'm glad you're posting them on your uh, social media and everything at well, Jerry Ordway we, for Twitter. Yeah, we just lost Ned Beatty a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And I was thinking about him. That's why when I first started, when, when Ned Beatty had passed away, I was thinking about, oh, I got to try to find that painting because I didn't have it on my iPad. My iPad's my go-to source for uh, stuff to post up on Twitter. So I was like, where do, I, where do I have it? I had to search my hard drive. But I was, I was thinking about how, again, while Superman, the movie, is not camp, it's got elements of lightheartedness Right. And there's a, the, the Otis stuff, Otis and Luther and Miss Teschmacher. That stuff is, is gold, you know? Absolutely, man. I'm and Valerie, here, yeah. per, Valerie Perrine is on Twitter and uh, she's she's got an active Twitter account and she posts, you know, different stuff. And, and that's kind of cool, too. Every so often I'll get a little, you know, like on something and, and that's that's kind of fun. Wow. That's great, man. Oh, God. Ned, yeah. I guess Ned Beatty's son. Uh, had has a movie Twitter or whatever a couple of years ago when I first posted that painting, he had sent me a, a private message. He said, "Hey, you really captured my dad. That's great." And you know, he he'd really appreciate it. You know, whatever. So I mean, you don't intend that, but it's nice to, that the stuff has a little bit of a reach. You know, my and favorite that, Otis moment is in the uh, the movie when uh, Luther's explaining the new coastal line of California and you see crossed off whatever, like Lutherville or whatever. And in that awesome crayon, black crayon, Otisburg, you know, it's just a little piece of land. Otisburg. All right. I'll rub it out. I'm sorry. I don't want to be political, but I had a flashback when they were, when that hurricane was coming from like a year ago or whatever. And Trump had, had had that magic marker extended to cover that area. I was thinking that somebody, Otisburg, because that's absolutely. Yeah, I've I remember seeing that too. Otisburg, exactly. <laughs> it was like here, Lex Luthor has this nice professional glass map, and he's got a magic marker thing. <laughs> absolutely, man. Uh, no, and all right, Mike Jones again. Yeah, la laugh out loud. Uh, <laughs> Ned Beatty and Superman. Yes, uh, <laughs> and they, where he sizes up. Well, that and even at the end when he's yelling from the prison uh, right. grounds. And then, you know, it's like I'm gonna I'm making a proclamation. He's making a proclamation <laughs> that these bars, that these bars here, will you shut up? Good stuff, man. Uh, the best. Great. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a tremendous, you know, again, a great movie, a great loss. I mean, you know, 1991, that's a good run for Richard Donner. I and seriously, I'm always incredibly sad when these people who meant so much to us go. But then when I see the age, it's like, oh, 91, that's a good run, man. He won. He, and you know, when, we're, when we're like 89, we're going to be going, oh, I got to get a couple more years out of this. Yeah, exactly. Now we got to make that Donner line. Absolutely, man. <laughs> Jesus. 100%. So Gene so, Hackman's still with us. Thank God. I know. Yeah. But, but much like uh, when, when Connery stopped acting, and I get, and I understand, they're, they're older gentlemen and they want to yeah. relax. But by the same time, it's like, oh, man, we miss you, man. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's why God Shatner, you know, Shatner's going to be 91 
And I'm like, will you just do like an audio of Star Trek and just be even though I mean, because then you could be sitting down and take yeah, your yeah. time. But it's like, give. I mean, oh, generations just annoyed the hell out of me in terms of what a lousy death for Captain oh, Kirk. Oh, yeah, like, yeah. We yeah, need we, more Captain Kirk stories, man. My daughter and I, we watched, I bought her the, the set of the movies because we, I got her, I, I kind of like bent her arm to watch the 60s show because she had watched the Next Generation stuff when she was oh, in wow. college, which sure. was a good show. But I said, you it was really see the show. original because that's yes. that's the camaraderie between the characters. So Absolutely. she enjoyed those. And then we made our way through the movies. And yeah, we were, I mean, the next, the, 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 the ending of, you know, whatever the the passing of the torch one i guess is the one that generations yeah yeah <clears throat> and it's not a terrible movie years away from it here's the thing it's like for me at least i was never like a diehard i liked the show i never watched it until probably again when it was on nickelodeon or something at some point in the <laughs> you know in the 60s i was too young and I, anything science oh. fictiony felt like it was too brainy for me you know, I, mean, I felt like the Fantastic Four felt too sciencey for me. So I like Spider-Man. I like Daredevil. I like Captain America. You know, so I had this thing when I was a kid, but yet I liked Lost in Space. But there was a kid in Lost in Space. So, sure. you know, so I didn't watch it. I, I didn't have that same vested interest. But watching the movies, I remember seeing them when they came out, you know, in the 80s or whatever. And seeing them again on the, the Blu-rays, <clears throat> I was like less invested in them to go, this is disappointing this is the best one still hits me as the 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 one with the whale the voice oh, yes, Star Trek four. sure um but i like them all i just have problems i think with the 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 passing of the torch one is 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 brutal because the movie is so good and then it's like they pass the torch and you, i felt like the other characters didn't really get as much of a send-off you know, I would have rather yeah. that had been a whole movie that just dealt with them rather than passing the torch. But, you know, I, they're all good in their own way. I mean, oh, yeah. especially thinking about how hard those things, a special effects movie, how hard it was to make those in the pre-computer, you know, effects days, you know. Absolutely. It was all, it was all you know, it was all Practical. meat. <laughs> it was all meat work, you know. You yeah. You had to build sets and they had to paint backgrounds and they had to make monster suits and what have you. I mean, it was a lot of creativity, you know? Absolutely, man. And even again, back to the Donner movies, think of Krypton, think of the fortress yeah. and all those practical sets that they had to build to make that shit rea uh, reality yeah. and everything. No, you're hundred percent right about well, you, that. You, you know, that's actually, it. I don't want to keep going, but here, oh, I, you, it is reminding me every time you mentioned Superman, I was remembering when, the movie was filming and I think, I don't remember one of the magazines at the time printed the pictures of uh, the Kryptonians, but from regular snapshots or regular photography. Right. And they looked like they were wearing crumpled up aluminum foil. And everybody in my circle, comic fans is like, Holy crap. That looks like that's the worst thing ever. This is going to be terrible. This is this. And again, it was taken out of context because it was, Basically, the, what I think it was the same material that they put on movie screens or something. It had the beads that reflected light, and they had a purpose to it. But taking a sneak picture on the set, you know, kind of tanks it. And that is so pervasive, and that still happens to this day when someone leaks a photo from a movie set. And then everybody comes out of the woodwork to say how terrible it is. And I think, how hard is it to work under these circumstances you know especially yes. now when people can you you know their phones to, to take pictures you can't really you know you can be 20 20 blocks away and somebody could you know <laughs> take a telephoto picture or something that they, one of the, the from the flash movie that they're filming now a couple of weeks ago everybody was like raking this poor girl who's playing supergirl over the coals because her costume looked weird and whatever and i kept thinking She's wearing a costume that's meant to be rigged, and that costume's not going to look like that once it's the, the effects are composited. Everything is, you know, it's just funny. Yes. But everybody, everybody's looking. Not everybody, but a lot of people are looking for just the negative aspect of it, and it it drives me nuts. Like, wait, I hear you, buddy. 
wait till the movie well, comes out, pay your money, and then you can complain. <laughs> you know? No question. No, it <laughs> happened in the first. It happened in the first Avengers movie. Yeah. They leaked. I think that fight scene where it's Iron Man, Captain America, and Thor, right. and it was somebody taking a picture from their their phone. And I said the same thing. I'm like, all right, let's see the red camera and the CGI right. and the lighting. Right. Right. I'm like, everybody relax. It's gonna be right. fine. And it was. It was amazing. So yeah, no, you're. I'm so with you on that, man. No, and again. Things never change. I mean, that's this is what we're dealing with, and that's that's why I am never one to pounce on a movie when it's new and then rush to you know start critiquing. I'm like, let everybody have a chance to watch yeah. it. Let me watch. Let me think about it for a while. Yeah. I mean, they did it with Joaquin Phoenix and Joker, and when yeah. those first shots of him in the clown suit, and everyone's like, that's not the Joker. Yeah. And then you know, and again, I've got my my hot and cold uh, opinions on Joker and stuff, but. For another time, yeah. you know. <laughs> well, Mitch, when I do the we do the podcast, Mitch is always like, he said somebody somebody keeps was saying, yeah, Jerry likes everything, and I said, you know, it's not that I like everything; it's that I appreciate the artistry and how hard it is. You know, like even for a movie that comes out terribly, you know that these people generally work really hard. <laughs> you know, so you yeah. almost feel. I just feel like this sympathy towards it because totally. it's not a, it's not an easy job. It's not digging coal or something, but it's it's a, a, a pressurized job with thousands of people working to create a product. You know, a comic book Great. is basically a handful of people making a product, you know. But uh, but so I, I, I tend to be more generous about just that yeah. if something's if I don't like it, I try not to talk about it too much. You know. I'm with you, man. No, I'm totally <laughs> with you, and I and I try to I try to adapt uh, the same idea when I, when I look at stuff as well. But Jared, amazing conversation as always. Yeah, it's I really fun. Appreciate it's been it. a while. Yeah, man. <laughs> no, I'm glad we did. Well, you know, and it's funny. I'll point people if we didn't talk enough Batman '89 for you. Our last conversation was a lot of that. So uh, definitely go through the archive and check out my other. And that also goes uh, to All Star Squadron and uh, Shazam. And yeah, all yeah. the various things. Truly, man, I'm so glad that we've gotten to know each other the, uh, over these last few years. And I always appreciate you coming back. Can't well, wait to well, see you at Terrificon. You can make yeah, fun yeah. of me live there. So Great. Well, thanks for having me on. Thank you, buddy. And everybody, thank you very much for watching. Uh, I'll promote uh, Kinescope again, uh, our new podcast with uh, Gabe Hardman. Thursday night, we're talking about uh, the first James Bond on film. Who could forget Barry Nelson as James Bond? Jimmy <laughs> Bond. It's Jimmy terrible, but it's Bond. hilarious. And and the saving grace, you really got to watch it, everybody. It's on YouTube. You can watch the whole uh, original Casino Royale. Peter Lorre plays Le Chief, and it's vintage Peter Lorre. Hi, yeah, hello, Mr. Good. Bond. You know, you can't help it. So, <laughs> you know, even even though even though uh, Barry Nelson wasn't the greatest 007, at least you got a good Le Chief to, uh, to keep you out. And it's only 50 minutes long, 5-0. So uh, I hope everyone will watch it and – Join us in the discussion on Thursday night, very late, 11.30 um, Central Time. Jerry will be in bed. It's 12.30 uh, Eastern, and it's 9.30 <laughs> Pacific. But uh, that's going to be a lot of fun Thursday night. So until then, everybody, stay 